London has always had criminals. The largest city in Britain is like a magnet to anyone wanting to make a bob or two, even if that means taking the law into their own hands. Since the 1900s, as many as 70 gangs have fought it out on London streets. Gun battles, knife crime, gang rivalries and alliances, robberies, protection and drug dealing. The city has seen them all. The most gang-infested district of London has been the East End. To some, a deviant area, one of physical and moral disorder. To others, it's both a kingdom and a gold mine. London has never bowed to one boss. As a city made up of many villages, it's always had many gangs. We're going to look at two gangs, past and present, both caught up in the urban battle for survival. Gangs have come and gone in London, the Second World War putting pay to many of them. The Sabinis from Clerkenwell, a mob not unlike the Mafia, flourished for almost 20 years, but by the 40s they were gone. The Elephant and Castle mob in the South endured into the 50s, but there was one gang which survived right up until the 1960s, and their origins go back to the 1800s. They were the Watney Streeters. Originally an Irish fighting gang, the Watney Streeters owed their success and survival to one thing, the river. It enabled them to make a good living from the docks which sprung up beside its banks. To find out about the Watney Streeters, I've come to meet author and historian James Morton. So James, I think we should talk about the history of the docks first. Well, the, the docks, uh, of course, have been here since people started importing stuff into England. But, I mean, one of the principal times was the 18th century when really sort of the pool of London between London Bridge and Tower Bridge uh, was taking something like 1500 ships at a time when it was really only designed for 600 and there were tremendous opportunities for theft from uh, those ships which were not properly guarded, not policed. The cargoes which were coming in were ivory, furs, tea, uh, coffee, anything and anything could be stolen and was. And what sort of people uh, were working on the docks? Well, generally speaking, an awful lot were Irish uh, immigrants who'd come over, certainly in the 18th century and also in the 19th century, particularly after the potato famines of the 1840s. The Irish immigrants really settled around Wapping. Somehow, um, there would have been lots of stealing going on from around the docks and there are small gangs and families who, who did those sort of things. Eventually, they all sort of came together, didn't they? Yes, certainly the, the most powerful collection were the Watney Streeters, and they were the people who controlled the docks, who got work on them, who could get a ticket later on to work regularly, who was picked for casual labour, uh, and so on. And they were, to a large extent, they were fighting gangs. So how did they make their money? Well, they, they, of course, they were paid a wage for a start, but there was, uh, as with any docks, if you have a dock, you've got enormous opportunities for theft. They could, the people who controlled the union could also decide who worked there. And so consequently, if you wanted to work on a dock, you had to pay uh, money to the people running the docks. So what about if other gangs stole things? They, you know... If other gangs, if other people stole things, uh, then really it's the same as the craze down the East End later, the, the, the Watney Streeters would expect to tax them. Perhaps if the property came to, I don't know, say 20 pounds, they'd want a fiver, that sort of thing. During 1919, 1,500 people were arrested for cargo poaching. The shipping police was formed to oversee cargoes being loaded and unloaded, but the stealing went on. Thieving from ships was almost customary. The theft of rum was prevalent. One method known as sucking the monkey was where they would siphon off the alcohol from the barrel using a hose. A second technique called spiking the cask involved simply drilling holes in the keg. 
and having extra long pockets sewn inside their trousers was a neat way of hiding any stolen goods from the day. During the First World War, pilfering was organized by the older dockers. They hired lads to do their dirty work. The boys could earn four pounds a week when a normal wage was only 12 shillings. To the streeters, it was more money for old rope. While the Irish immigrants settled down by the docks, a hundred years later, a new wave of Asian immigrants were arriving in London. This is Southall in West London. In the 1950s, Indian and Pakistani immigrants came here to find jobs in the factories and at the airport. Now, 85% of the residents here are Asian. The influx of Asians gave rise to the likes of the Teddy Boys and the much more powerful groups like the National Front. The Asians had to defend themselves, so they formed gangs. Now, one of these gangs was called the Tutti Nung. I'm meeting up with a man who has done a lot of research into this, journalist and crime writer, Tony Thompson. First of all, tell me about when did uh, gangs first emerge in this area? Well, around the Southall area, they really started around the late 60s, early 70s, which was around the same time that we started to get a large population of people from the Indian subcontinent coming to this part of London and setting up shop here. Uh, so, um, in the early days when they were being here, there was a lot of racism, a lot of uh, people being attacked by um, uh, sort of people like the National Front and so on. And uh, they started to defend themselves by gathering together in vigilante gangs to defend themselves against the racists. Uh, but what happened was once, once the threat from the racists started to fade a little bit, those gangs stayed around, started attacking each other and started preying on the local community themselves. What happened a lot of the time was that they would go to shop owners and local businesses and demand protection money, uh, saying that you know um, they would help them to uh, prevent being attacked by racists and so on and, and guard their properties. Yeah. Um, and once so they were attacking their own community, really. Yeah, I mean they, they started off defending them, but then they went into attacking them once the actual problem disappeared because they still wanted to be around and they thought, well, we might as well make some money out of this, and slowly moved into organised crime. It's actually exactly what happened with the mafia in Sicily as well. They started off the same way, being a group of vigilantes who, once the threat had gone, ended up becoming an organised crime group. Initially, the gang was known as the Holy Smokes, but caste divisions within it created a rift. So, so the Holy Smokes in the 70s, they were the big gang, the big Asian gang, and they, uh, they split at one point, didn't they? Yeah, what happened is that um, the whole Indian community has a, a big problem with, um, with caste. If you're the wrong caste, you can't sort of associate with people of a different caste. And within the Holy Smokes, they had several different castes. And uh, some of the people at the, in the lower caste felt they weren't being treated properly by those in the higher caste. So they ended up going off and forming their own gang, which they called the Tutti Nungs. They saw themselves as being from the lowest caste. Tutti Nung means the worthless ones. Where there had been unity, there was now bitterness and rivalry between the Tutti Nung and the Holy Smokes. To find out about the consequences of this rift, I'm going along to see Dr Avtar Litt, founder of Sunrise Radio, which has been here in Southall since the 80s. The radio station is kind of part of, it's really a centre of a community, right? So when was the first time you heard about the Tutti Nung, the, the Holy Smokes? Well, we used to run a radio station from the marketplace, which is about, you know, um, in the sort of early 80s, um, right from the heart of the town. And um, and we used to play uh, dedications and songs to Tutti Nung, the Holy Smokes, young girls to call up to say, you know, this is this next song for so-and-so. We didn't know who they were. Um, we, I came from outside Southall and it was just a normal broadcast. You know, it's yeah. like a, um, a daughter sending a um, um, dedication to an auntie or something. Yeah. And it's only later on we found out that Tutti Nungs and Holy Smokes were really local sort of mini gangsters, you know, sort of, so to speak, you know. Uh, the Holy Smokes, for example, uh, they were made of youngsters. And uh, one would like to think that the pillars of the community uh, w w would be there to give guidance and disperse. But in this particular case, they actually fostered those gangs. Unlike most outfits that grow from the street upwards, this gang was formed and nurtured by the elders from the top down. The local community actually had a legitimate way of making money. There were community organisations at the time. Control of those, those community organisations became very important. Yeah. And this is how gang culture was actually encouraged by the members of the community. Uh, older members of the community, the pillars of society, the kind of people who would sit at the uh, local superintendent, police or super, uh, superintendent's office to sort out the community problems. 
So it was ingrained quite deep, the oh, whole yeah, game absolutely. culture. It was actually encouraged by the community yeah. elders. They did it uh, not because they want lawlessness in the, um, uh, in the community or in the country or, or in the town. They did it because that was their muscle, effectively, yes, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. in order to control an organization. Yeah. But, but you see, basically, this is not um, something new to the Asian culture. I mean, if you look at mm. the Indian cities of Bombay and all the rest of it, it is almost customary that, you know, a shopkeeper would actually pay the local gang protection money on a weekly basis. It happens today. And you can't even escape from it, you know. Mm. Most members of the public didn't know anything about it. But I think, you know, in the late, in the early 80s, uh, it's you know people starting to fear if somebody would say well you know I'm I, I'm a so -and -so, gang member so and yeah. so people would shy away from challenging that person. So if you were a kid, would you choose to be either one or the other, or or were you born into it almost? I think they were actively rec actively recruiting uh, people mm. from schools and other things, um, and I think that you know it was almost fashionable uh, to be part of one or the other. Sunrise. It only hit home to Avtar how threatening the gangs were when he realised their influence extended into his own news team. With the journalists so intimidated, they felt unable to even mention the gangs in their reporting. There was uh, one uh, supposed to be head of gang who was um, sent to prison and he, was, uh, he, went, he went inside. And um, my news team actually refused to carry the story because the news team actually, they're all very famous journalists now, but 20 years ago mm. they, were, they were beginners, they worked for local newspapers, they came to work for the local yeah. radio station and I threatened to sack the entire news team simply because because they had gone to school, local schools, they knew how the setup was far more than I did and they said they weren't prepared to carry the news, although the man had been convicted, sent to prison. And they said they, they value their face a lot more than actually um, um, their jobs. Yeah. So they were really controlling the community with fear? Yes. Yes, it was, it was, I think the fear, um, uh, I think they probably did a lot less, but you know, the fear was far greater. But by the 1980s, the fighting between the two gangs became so violent and so public that everyone in Southall became aware of a serious gang problem. I want to know why it got so out of control. Despite the fact that they started off together uh, within the same gang, once they split, they became mortal enemies. Um, I think in some ways it gave them something to do by attacking one another. They'd be vicious battles, I mean, sort of um, like nothing that had ever been seen in the area before. But they'd be involving machetes and, and hammers and screwdrivers and, and all sorts of knives, and people would be often very badly hurt. Um, but these were seen as a, a great source of pride for the gangs as to who would come off better. It was a bit like sort of the worst kind of football hooliganism, you know, with these two mass gangs coming together in public and just brawling together. Uh, and it would happen on a regular basis. Were they out to kill each other or...? I think the, the idea was, was never specifically to kill, it was always just to sort of win, win the fight, but some people did die occasionally. Um, but it was more about people getting really badly injured and, and badly hurt as a result of the activities that were going on. The horrors of the street battles prompted ordinary residents to start coming forward and gradually information began to seep out. The police set up a special squad to investigate. It was called Operation Shampoo. It would reveal an international organisation of more than 2,000 soldiers with interests in illegal immigration, extortion, fraud, violence, heroin dealing and armed robberies. Operation Shampoo was about to lift the lid off of organised crime in Southall. In the early part of the 20th century, London's East End was a patchwork of gangs. In Whitechapel, there were the Bessarabians, Russian Jews who went from fighting anti-Semitic violence to running protection rackets. To counter them, there were the Jewish vigilantes called the Odessians. The Blind Beggar Gang was a team of pickpockets from Bethnal Green. Street thugs formed into groups and called themselves the Titanics, the Hoxton Mob, or the Vendetta Mob. There were the Jamaican Eddie Mannings and a Japanese outfit called Ses Miyakawa running drug rings. And then, down beside the river, controlling some of the busiest docks in the world, were the Watney Streeters. Up until the late 40s, they were led by a man called Jimmy Fuller. And this was their manor, Watney Street in Wapping. I'm hoping that James can tell me something about the place. 
James, here we are on Watney Street. Yeah. I mean, not quite how it would have been in the 20s. No, in those days it would be back to back, no indoor lavatories, right. um, sort of shed in the back garden, certainly no baths, nothing like that. But, but pubs and shops? Pubs and shops, certainly. I mean, turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, uh, it would have had a hundred shops and probably a um, hundred stalls on a Sunday morning. And a strong Irish And a very strong Irish neighbourhood. I mean, they all married, intermarried, a big Catholic community would intermarry. Uh, I mean, it's always said you never knew who your cousin was uh, because of the intermarriage in those days, at the, as I say, turn of the century. And the, the Watney Street has maintained a presence, certainly, uh, throughout the 1920s, for example, they were used by a man called Arthur Harding, or so he says, to break up uh, parts of the general strike. How many people were, were in this gang? I don't know, it's a very loose, amorphous thing. I can't think it's a gang. I think that they were, generally speaking, a fighting community, and if you needed uh, them, they would rally round you. They'd, if they weren't fighting themselves, they'd um, come, right. and, come and help out. Yeah, well, they, were, they were obviously... Fighters to hire. Big, big fighting gang, yes. There were several gangs that the streeters had to fend off. One of them was the Sabinis, a mafia outfit from Clerkenwell. Certainly the story is that they had one day ambushed the Sabinis who came on a recce down here, I think, to deal with some bookmakers, and they found that they'd walked into a trap. Uh, and the Watney Street is allegedly, and this would be what, the middle twenties again, uh, gave them a good hiding and sent them back uh, to Clerkenwell. The streeters had been going for over a century. They made a tidy income. They'd got through the war when others had fallen. They'd survived the loss of their leader, Jimmy Fuller. But now there will be two forces which would bring about their demise. The first of these was out of their control. It was quite simply progress. The docks in Wapping suffered heavy bombing during the war. It wasn't worth rebuilding them, and the ships were now getting much larger. They needed deeper water. Trade was moved downriver to Tilbury. By the 1950s, the London docks were closing. And this street was the heart of it. How did it change uh, once the docks started to... Well, uh... of course, you've got terrible deprivations in the war. I mean, you've got... Uh sort of Surrey docks, for example, in the war, one night, 380,000 ton tonnes of timber was destroyed. So you can think of the, the terrible um, deprivation that the East End suffered. Yes. Uh, after the war, uh, there's a sort of regrouping, but by the 1960s, you're getting container ships and the London docks can't cope with them. They haven't got the depth to cope with them. And so the docks moved down to Tilbury. Right. And consequently, the Watney Street is then, or the people on the docks, start to lose their power. The streeters began to diversify. They work with the Jewish gangs in Allgate, who run the clubs, the brothels and the gambling joints. They provided protection for them. They'd always had a tough reputation, and they liked to fight. The Watney Streeters had always been enemies of Bethnal Green. They'd crossed the Sabinis a few times when they were in power there, but the Streeters had always managed to deal with them. Now they faced a new threat, which would eventually lead to their destruction, the Craze. What other types of gangs were coming up through the 50s that were making their lives less easy? I, I don't think they were making their lives less easy. I think, in fact, that the... the, the the families were getting old, they'd made their money. Uh, some were moving out, for example, George Cornell, who was killed by Ronnie Cray. Uh, he married a, a girl from South London, went over South London. It, it just sort of generally drifted away. Right, but um, there was a sense that with the, when the Crays came around, that the Crays and, and, and the Watney Streeters were going to meet. The Crays and the Watney Streeters were always going to clash sooner or later, without any doubt. By 1956, the twins were making serious money. They controlled an area from Bethnal Green, east to Mile End, Stepney and Bow, 
and north to Hackney and Walthamstow. Within this area of 14 square miles, every gambling den, most of the pubs and many businesses, down to petty thieves, all paid their dues to the craze. They were already known as the most dangerous mob in London. They would always be a threat to any surviving streeter. And it wasn't long before one of them, called Charlie, attracted their attention. Streeter Charlie would encounter the craze on several occasions. He had a scam going with local post office drivers who would readdress parcels to places where he could collect them. Ronnie Cray, hearing of the potential of the post office scam, demanded 50% of the profits. Charlie was not forthcoming with any money. He became listed by Ronnie as someone he would soon have to deal with severely. Ronnie's violent hatred towards anyone coming into his manor would lead him in the autumn of 1956 to use a gun and shoot someone for the first time. One of the Watley Streeters, uh, a friend of his, has a run-in with a garage uh, who sold him a dud car. And uh, he creates a bit of um, difficulty with the, the vendor of the car, putting it absolutely neutrally. Uh, Red Ronnie won't have this, and he, he shot the man in the leg. He shot the docker in the leg. Was the, the garage was playing protection to the craze at that point, I take it? Yes, that would be uh, the way of putting it. I, I think in, Ronnie would always say it was a friend of his, but I have a horrid feeling that money was exchanged for the friendship. And do you think Ronnie did this because he wanted to show other gangs, the Watney Streeters, of his power? Yes, but of course Ronnie was completely out of control anyway, even back then. And whereas another person would have just given him a bad beating or perhaps a cutting, uh, Ronnie took it that one stage further. But it was it was the it was these moments in Ronnie's these career. Are these are defining moments. Where yes. he never had to be violent again. Once the, once he fired those guns in those first few years of yes. his career, he could live off that. That's right. And uh, anyway, eventually, just to show his power, he has a whip round in the East End, and uh, the, the docker is bought a pub or a share in a pub. And it shows that really sort of the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. It's a charity as well. But what happened? Did Ronnie get caught for this? There was an identification parade, uh, and no one was picked out, surprisingly enough. Because legend has it that Reggie turned up that day. Reggie turned up and was going to say, if he was picked out, oh, I'm Reggie, and would foul up the identification parade anyway. But it never came to it. The fix was in. To the Watney Streeters, this was just a foretaste of what was to come. The Crays were a new breed of criminal, unpredictable, violent and ruthless. Their hunger for power knew no bounds, and they were about to unleash violence of a type never before seen in the city. In Southall at the end of the 80s, there was another gang flexing its muscles, the Tutti Nun. They may not be so well known as the Crays, but they soon became every bit as powerful. One man who had been on the receiving end of their threats was a Greenford shopkeeper called Mirinda Palmer. Shortly after depositing his life savings of £20,000 into a local building society, two young Asian men walked into his shop, asked him to come outside for what they said was a business proposition. He was directed into the back seat of a car and a gun was pointed to his head. One of them said, we're the Tutti Nun. You know how important we are and we want £20,000. It's a simple choice. You either pay us the money or we kill you and we feed you to our dog. Mahinda Palmer withdrew the £20,000 and handed it over one week later. Worried that the gang knew exactly how much he had in his account, and terrified that they would return, he phoned the police. I'm meeting up with the man he spoke to, former detective superintendent, Roy Herridge. Tell me about Mahinda Palmer and his part. 
Well, I understand that Mr. Palmer was being put under a number of threats in his shop, um, and it appeared to be protection. Now, I know <coughs> my officers investigated that, and in the end, the case finished up at the, the Crown Court, where um, people were uh, prosecuted and dealt with. That was one of the first people that came over and gave us information as what was going on. And I think after we dealt with the individuals who were dealing with Palmer, then the public had confidence in the team that were investigating matters. And from that time onwards, a lot more information stemmed yeah. from that one inquiry. The courage of Mr. Palmer going to the police opened a tiny crack in a vast criminal organization. But this hadn't brought the Tutti Nung down because the structure of the gang meant it was almost impossible to penetrate. It's actually a very similar way to the way the terrorist cells work, and that you have a, an inner organisation and you have these independent cells, and if you bust one of the cells, you haven't broken up the organisation at all, you've just taken out that one cell. And, and these gangs are kind of started working from that model. Uh, so if the police did ever have any success and find a few gang members and find out what they were doing and arrest them or put them away, the rest of the organisation was completely isolated and could still carry on independently. By the late 1980s, the inroads made by the police had shown that there was a hierarchy to the gang. At its heart lay a group of powerful men. Up until now, they had remained untouchable. It was this inner circle that Operation Shampoo set out to crack. It would unearth one of the largest heroin smuggling operations ever discovered in Britain. By the mid-50s, the craze had control of the East End. Now they wanted a slice of the action up west. But the Watney Streeter called Charlie, who had crossed them before, would jeopardize their plans. In 1956, friends of the craze called Jones and Ramsey took over a drinking club in Soho called the Stragglers Club. Jones and Ramsey called in the twins to handle any troublemakers. Reggie and Ronnie were delighted to form a partnership with them. But like a bad penny, the Watney Streeter Charlie would reappear. Jones got into an argument with him, and Charlie beat him up severely. Now his business partner Ramsey, together with the Cray twins, would retaliate with a merciless attack. So, James, this is where the fight happened at the Britannia. It's now a perfect fried chicken place. Absolutely. It's just, of course, by the Shadwell railway station. And this is where Reggie, Ronnie, uh, Billy Jones and Bobby Ramsey came looking for the Watney Streeters who had done up Ramsey. What happened was the Streeters got wind that the craze mob was on its way. Uh, in the front was a, a fellow who got nothing to do with it but was related to the Streeters, a man called Terry Martin. Out the back go the Watley Streeters whom the craze are really looking for. And uh, there is poor old Terry Martin in front, uh, left really more or less on his own. He's dragged out and given a stabbing with the bayonet. By who do we know? Bonnie, uh, and possibly Bobby Ramsey. It's difficult to know who really does what, but they all give him a terrible hammer. So just here on this just pavement? Just here on this pavement, yeah. And where the Watney Streeters are, uh, uh, have, have decamped, yes, very sensibly. Interesting, but it sent out quite a big signal to the Watney Streeters. It did, and instead of having taken their revenge on Terry Martin, they then went looking for these cowardly Watley Streeters to give them a lesson. I think Bobby Ramsey runs a traffic light, and in those days you might find people, uh, police on the street, and they're pulled over, and there's a, a bloodstained bayonet and various other ammunition and equipment in the car. There's some blood on Reggie's tie, which he explains to the court when they go to the Old Bailey, that um, it had come from a, a nosebleed while he was watching a boxing match. It was somebody else's blood that leant out of the ring, and there's the no journey DNA. wore it, and there was no DNA, no DNA. in those days. Um, Ronnie gets three years, um, Jones and Ramsey get five and three years. Right.
The Cray twins were tried for assault on Terry Martin. Their attempt to bribe him had failed. In court, the jury accepted that the bloodstains on Reggie's jacket might have come from boxing in the gym, and he was acquitted. Ronnie had no such luck. He took the fall and went off for his first stretch in prison for three years. Ramsey got five, Jones three. The Stragglers Club was shut down. The Crays were out there getting their hands dirty, but the outfit I'm looking at, a Hindu gang called the Tuti Nung, is a totally different setup. On the street level, there's intense gang rivalry, but at the top, the bosses delegate. They don't fight, they work together. They're not interested in rivalry, they're interested in making money. The inner circle at the top scoops up all of the money from their scams and puts it all into the big money maker, heroin. The inner circle of the Tutti Nung were always removed from their crimes, insulated, you could almost say untouchable. But there's always that one fatal slip, that little chink in the armour. And in this case, when it appeared, Roy Herridge and his team on Operation Shampoo jumped on it. As well as making around 80 arrests among the Tutti Nung, Operation Shampoo also stumbled upon more senior gang members. One of them, called Barkat Khan, began to bribe witnesses. How does Barkat Khan fit into all of this? But once the police started Operation Shampoo, they obviously had a number of court cases that resulted. Uh, in one of those cases, one of the witnesses was bribed, and the person who was accused of putting the bribes in was this character called Barkat Khan. Uh, as a result of that, the police then started following him to see what he was involved in, and it turned out that he was a massive heroin smuggler on a scale that the police had never really come across before. Certainly in this part of London, no one had ever been operating on that kind of scale. The Khan case gave a real insight into the methods used by gangs to import heroin. The distribution was through gang-owned restaurants who can safely import large quantities of goods from India and Pakistan on a regular basis. They have a high cash turnover, extensive storage space, and no one ever looked suspicious going into a restaurant. Barkat Khan ran a highly sophisticated, well-planned and lucrative operation. All the money the Tutinam made in their other frauds and scams, the protection money, the credit cards, the bogus mortgages, was all invested into a massive and regular smuggling operation of heroin into Heathrow Airport. It involved a vast network of gang members, men and women, all working together. It all depended upon couriers, trusted friends or families from the gang, and usually women. They would be flown out of Heathrow to India or Pakistan. They would usually go for a few weeks and be able to visit their families and have a paid holiday. But on their return, they would bring back heroin. Boarding and body checks in Pakistan could be easily avoided. The gang wielded considerable power there. Officials could be bribed to turn a blind eye. But it was the return trip to Heathrow where the gang's ingenuity and planning would be critical. With vigilant customs officials and the latest scanning devices, it would be risky trying to smuggle the drugs through customs. But the Tutti Nung had a simple, undetectable and foolproof solution. When the couriers entered the baggage reclaim area, they would slip off to the ladies' toilets. There, they would remove the packages of heroin. Each courier had been given a key to the tampon dispenser. Here, the drugs were hidden, and the courier, now totally clean, could pass through customs and leave the airport. Now, there was just one more link in the operation. The gang had people employed at the airport as cleaners. As soon as the couriers had cleared, their job was now to move and pick up the drugs. Once in their hands, it was no problem to take the drugs out of the airport. With so many people regularly going back and forth, nothing looked out of the ordinary. This operation didn't raise any suspicions. That must have involved the gang being everywhere, right? Working in airports. Yeah, I mean, what they did was they actually got gang members to go and get jobs in specific places if they knew that it would be useful to them in terms of getting drugs into the country. So it was a very sophisticated operation from that point of view. And police believe 
that he was bringing in about 10 kilos of heroin a day. How much is that? It's about that 100,000 pounds a day. But they reckon it was um, operating for about 10 years wow. before they discovered it. So we're talking millions and millions of pounds that his gang was making. Um, all of which was coming into the, into the UK at heroin and being spread out within this community and within the rest of London as well. The Tutti Nung were bringing in 10 kilos a day, worth £100,000. They did this for 10 years. That's £365 million. That's the proceeds of all those bank cards and PIN numbers that went missing in the post. All those bogus mortgages and insurance scams. All those threatened shopkeepers. All collected up and invested in drug trafficking. The tentacles of this operation stretch into every corner of everyday life, creating misery for every person they touch. On November the 5th, 1956, Ronnie Cray entered Wandsworth Prison to start a three-year sentence. During that time, he was moved to Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight and also the psychiatric wing of Winchester Prison. By his release in spring 1959, he would be certified insane. But three years away hadn't erased Ronnie's memory. He hadn't forgotten the culprits who he'd wanted to hunt down the night he was caught. The Watney Streeters. And so the legend goes, in spring 1959, Ronnie and Reggie and the rest of the firm came down here to the London Hospital Tavern. Inside drinking were the Watney Streeters. This time, there will be no escape. Ronnie and the firm stormed in, and the beating they gave the Watney Streeters was severe. The following day, the newspapers described it as the worst gang fight in the East End for years. Not long after that, the leader of the Streeters asked Reggie for a job. It was the end of the Watney Streeters. But they lived on as individuals, many of them joining rival gangs. And I think that um, the Maltese who are coming into the area at the time, sort of the commercial road and so on, running clubs and spielers and indeed running girls, uh, they are starting to pay money to what's left of the Watney Streeters, who in turn are paying it to the Crays. And they're all moving out now of the area, the docks yes. are diminishing. The docks are now... And they're older. The 60s are gone, yes. The, they've made their money, they're going respectable. Uh, they're moving out of Dockland, out to Essex, to Basildon, Romford, places like that. But there would be one more murder. The final nail to be hammered into the Watney Streeters' coffin. And eventually, Ronnie... Uh, kills one of the Watney Streeters and George Cornell. Yes, now George Cornell uh, has moved. He's one of the ones who's actually gone over to the South London and aligned himself with the Richardsons. Cornell comes over to meet a man uh, whom actually it was suggested Ronnie had shot as well. He comes over to visit him in hospital and uh, thinks he'll have a drink out of, presumably out of bravado and sheer folly in, in the blind beggar in the Mile End Road, yeah. and that is when Ronnie gets wind of this, decides who's going to be shown to be the master of the East End and goes in and in front of a, really only the barmaid and one other elderly man um, pulls the trigger on Cornell. Here at the Blind Beggar pub in 1968, Ronnie shot George Cornell, a man who had once been a Watney Streeter. And the rest, as they say, is history. The Watney Streeters were never seen again. In Southall, Operation Shampoo had unearthed a massive smuggling operation, bringing 100,000 pounds of heroin into Heathrow Airport every day. It had been run by a man in the inner circle of the Tutti Nung gang. His name was Barkat Khan. How did they catch him in the end? But they caught him because they, they found out about him from the, uh, the bribe that he tried to make for the witness. Once they started oh, following yeah, him, yeah. they, they realised what was going on. Uh, I mean, Barkat Khan problem, uh, Khan's problem was that he didn't like delegating stuff, so he was always very hands-on. He was always there to supervise what was going on. So when the police started following him, it was immediately obvious what he was involved in, and uh, he got a long sentence as a result. The police operation in Southall taken the lid off a massive crime organisation. Khan was convicted of attempting to import heroin. 
he got four years. By 1989, prominent members of the Tutti Nar had become exposed, and more local residents came forward with information to rid gangs from the neighborhood and from the lives of their children. Well, I think really a lot of the parents wanted their children to be dealt with in order, because they are a very, very law-abiding society in normal life, but these youngsters seem to move away from that society and become gang members. And the parents, a lot of parents came forward to help us. What happened to Shampoo in the end? Well, in Operation Shampoo um, finished, um, just before I retired, actually. And, and I think, really, at that stage, um, we'd come to a virtual end of our inquiry. I think we dealt with the major part of the Tutti Nuns and Holy Smokes. And I think if you speak to the community now, those individuals have been dealt with as far as the law is concerned and have come out and have very happy, straightforward families now and have good businesses. So how many, in the end, were put into prison? I think about 40 people overall were put, were put to prison and overall I think we dealt with about 80 individuals overall, yeah. Today, Avtar Lip believes that most youngsters have other aspirations. He thinks they now look towards building careers rather than joining gangs. I think there has been, um, um, in the last few years, uh, people who have recently arrived from India or whatever, mm. uh, they think they've got four or five people put together, they can actually put pressure on the others, but they're not gangs as they were, uh, you know, the, in the 80s. They no longer have the glass ceilings which they used to have mm. in 1780s. Uh, I think people it's now... It's true, that's a really good point. Uh, yeah. uh, they're, they're, you know, people, uh, people feel they can achieve anything now, they're, you know, so, so therefore, uh, the same people who were probably members of the gang, they're probably coaching their daughters and sons to become accountants not, and doctors, not, um, not, not gangsters. But Tony Thompson is less optimistic. So the Tutti Nun are finished, but completely? I think Operation Shampoo definitely shut them down for a while, but like all of these things, um, they only, only really became more sophisticated and realised what they needed to do to not get caught in the future. So I think they're still around. They just keep a much lower profile, um, they're not quite so showy, and they're not quite so obvious, but they're still there and they're still making money. Well, I think what's interesting about youth gangs these days is that it's become a kind of career path. It used to be a sort of phase that you went through. You'd be in a gang, you'd hang out with your mates, and when you got to 18 or so, you'd give up because there was no money in it. But now, even at a young age, you can make a lot more money out of being in a street gang than you can from doing a legitimate job. So a lot of these young kids end up um, just on the first step of a career ladder that takes them into more serious crime, into armed robbery, into major league drug dealing by the time they're in their 20s. Southall is ever-changing. Just as the British and the Irish moved further out in the 1950s, so now the Sikh population followed them. New communities are moving in from Somalia and Afghanistan. The area is becoming more diverse. Heroin still plagues the Southall community and the country at large. Because of gangs like the Tutti Nun, the price of a gram of heroin has dropped from £100 to £40, while the purity has doubled. Since the millennium, a new generation of gangs have developed. They're fragmented, less organised, and nothing on the same scale as the Tutti Nun. But perhaps that's just appearances. Perhaps we can't see what's really there. All we know is that drugs are still on the street cheaper than ever, so someone's still bringing them in. November 1990, Rygate, Surrey. Like a scene from a movie, gunmen ambush a Securicor van carrying large amounts of money. But the police are one step ahead and about to crack the biggest South London crime family since the Richardsons. In the 20s, a different family was controlling the streets of South London. One of them, the so-called Queen, Alice Diamond, was about to lose control and bring about her downfall. Her gang of 40 thieves was the biggest shoplifting network Britain had ever seen. In this programme, we're going to be looking at two gangs, both from different eras but both fighting over the same piece of South London turf. We'll be looking at one of the oldest and longest-running gangs of all time to see why they were so successful. 
And what happened to that same South London turf after the 60s? And how the gangs there have remained in competition ever since? We've all heard the stories of the Crays and the Richardsons, gangs who ran the streets of London in the 50s and 60s. But who came next? Who filled the void? One gang who came to prominence were certain members of a Turkish Cypriot family from southeast London. They were four brothers, Bakir, Mehmet, Dennis and Dogen, known as the kings of the Old Kent Road, and their name, the Arifs. <sighs> I'm meeting up with crime writer and historian Wensley Clarkson. I want to find out who the Arifs took over from in South London. Where we're sitting today, this used to be a Richardson area. This was it? all the Richardson Manor, um, right the way up to the Thames. I mean, they really ruled it. Yeah, every pub along the Old Kent Road and in the back streets, um, they had a, a say in how it was run. Yeah. Uh, there were a wonderful array of drinking clubs, spielers, if you go back even further to the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and the Richardsons used that network of pubs to gain a lot of power in the area and that was the key to the power when it came to families especially in the 60s but I think as far as the the Richardsons were concerned they thought they were kings of the world the, as far as they were concerned south of the river was theirs no one could touch them they'd have a, you know, a few little crossovers with the craze did they ever come down here the craze? Well, the craze occasionally did come down here and then he was bedlam there was uh, a shootout of Mr Smith's yeah. that was partly connected to to the craze and there were other uh, small pockets of trouble. But overall, the demarcation line, which was the river, was abided by. The Crays were up here in North London. The Richardsons down here in the south. And when they'd gone, we had the Arifs. After the Richardsons were in prison, there was a void. There were no immediate successors. The Richardsons weren't old enough to have children who were adults. Other families held back for whatever reason, I don't know. But that pocket, that void, enabled a number of much more ruthless criminals to come onto the scene, particularly the four brothers who'd come over to South London from northern Cyprus during the 60s and early 70s, and they were determined to make their mark. This used to be their patch. They brought up pubs, clubs and restaurants. Between them, they also made their money from armed robberies and drug trafficking. They had amazing contacts in Turkey, which was part of the heroin trail from India. How else did they make money then? Besides heroin, some of the Arabs stepped into the robbery game with a vengeance. To begin with, they worked with some of the likely lads who actually came, were born and bred in South London, classic criminals, some of whom were related to or friends of the great train robbers. And some of the Arabs, they started to hit uh, money in transit. In other words, money that was being transferred from banks. They shocked a lot of the old time villains here because of the nature of the way they went about their business. Despite their new criminal status, the Arif brothers began modestly. After running a cafe off the Deptford Broadway, they went on to amass a string of legitimate businesses, such as jewelers, pubs, bodybuilding gyms, and a nightclub called the Connoisseur on the Old Kent Road. Through their crimes, they made so much money that many years later, in 1990, the Arifs held a wedding reception at the Savoy, costing £30,000. Many of the other crime families attended. By this time, the Arif brothers were thought to be the single most powerful criminal gang in South London. But if you go back 70 years to the 1920s, the area around Elephant Castle was the turf of another gang, the Elephant Boys. By the 1920s, the Elephant and Castle gang, the Elephant Boys, or just the Elephant, were already 100 years old. Their members 
were smash and grab artists, burglars, fences and thugs. They were dapper and intelligent and regarded with a grudging respect by the police. I've come to meet Brian McDonald, historian and author of Elephant Boys. So, Brian, you've got a personal connection with the Elephant and Castle Gang? Yes, I mean, through my uncles, uh, who were sort of leaders of the Elephant Castle leading up to World War I. They were bookmakers and uh, sort of tough guys and villains and smart Alex, that sort of family. I, my uncle Wag, who was the leader, of the Elephant Boys had a string of bookmakers' pitches, which were illegal in those days. And if you wanted to be a bookmaker in South East London, you had to rent a pitch from him. It was a close-knit thing. And uh, membership was handed down from family to family so that, you know, children followed their fathers into the community. So how many people would be in this gang? Uh, oh, they were in the sort of gangs within a gang. You know, the Elephant Culture Gang was one sort of great community, but you had warehouse thieves, smash and grab. And uh, they all knew each other, you know, but they all did different sort of specialties. And, and did other gangs in other parts of London sort of hire out these guys? Yes, I mean, they, I think certainly at one time they hired out the muscle in the, when in the 50s, when I was a lad. I mean, they supported gangsters like Jack Spot, who was the premier gangster in, in London. You would have people in the gang who were good fighters, you would have to have, you know, to do some of the things that you were doing. George Cornish, who was a detective at the time, said of the Elephant and Castle gang that they were smart, well-dressed, well-educated, aristocrats of crime. Oh, really? But there was another branch of the Elephant gang, comprised of wives, daughters and girlfriends, an entire girl gang known as the Forty Thieves. This girl gang within the Elephant and Castle gang. How did that come about? They would first, or in the early stages, they would carry burglars tools for the men, you know, because if a man got caught, he didn't want to have these things found on him. So the girls would do that. They were also pickpockets, I think, some of them. I think it was with the early movies that come out and the Flapper Society and uh, watching films in the 1910s, 1920s of America and things like that. They want to be like it. And what do you get if you haven't got much money? You go out and you steal. So they would target West End shops and other shopping centres, and they would dress themselves up in these wonderful clothes. But one of the 40 thieves gained a formidable reputation. She was racy, she was stylish, and she was tough. Her name was Alice Diamond. Born in Southwark in 1886, Alice was the daughter of criminals. Her father had once pushed the head of the Lord Mayor's son through a plate glass window. By the age of 17, Alice had a criminal record for stealing from a hat shop in Oxford Street. Alice Diamond was born in Lambeth Workhouse Infirmary. When you read the history of it, it's more like a mortuary, the way they describe it, with stone cold tables and things like that. So she didn't come into the world in the most pleasant circumstances. Right. And sometime during World War I, she was arrested for using another girl's card for, in a munitions factory. So she went in under a false identity. Why would she do that? Well, I would think probably to get explosives, because at this time, the process of blowing up safes was growing in London. It right. was something that had been introduced from America. American gangsters coming over here said, well, you're still opening safes with a tin opener sort of thing. No, this is what we use, gelignite, you know. So what kind of woman was Alice Diamond uh, to become the queen of this bunch? Well, I think principally she must have been a good organiser. She would... There were thieves before, but when she came on the scene, she organised them into cells. So that there was four or five girls to a cell. They would target one shop, or they would hit the high street with three or four shops at a time. Detective Cornish described them as the cleverest of thieves. He said that there was nothing like them at all, you know, and they, they could walk into a shop and they could literally strip it. And Alice and her elephants were every bit as tough as the men. They said her punch was as strong as a man's, and the diamond rings covering her fingers caused maximum damage. Under Alice Diamond's reign, the gang prospered. She masterminded the largest shoplifting operation ever seen in this country. But it wouldn't be robbery that would be her downfall. By the late 80s, the four Arif brothers, Bakir, Mehmet, Dennis and Dogen, were the number one crime family in South London. They had enough money to indulge any passion. 
they could relax and enjoy the lifestyles of millionaires. Dogan had funded and managed his own football team. Fisher Athletic nearly made it into the fourth division, but that was their only indulgence. The Arif brothers kept grafting. In 1993, Dogan was convicted of being knowingly concerned in the fraudulent evasion of the prohibition of cannabis. The smuggling operation involved the shipment of 2.5 tonnes of cannabis with a street value in the United Kingdom of some 8.5 million pounds. Like all big outfits, the further the Aris distanced themselves from their operations, the less likely they were to be caught. But they were uh, an old-fashioned gang at heart. They liked to get their hands dirty. It was more of a matter of honour, and it told everyone else on the manor just who was in charge. The police didn't want another powerful crime family taking root in South London. So they set up a special squad with the sole purpose of targeting the Arifs. It was only a matter of time. In the 80s, the Arifs were kings. They were running everything. They seemed to be getting away with everything. Even when they got nicked, they got off. But yeah, they, they really were becoming legendary figures. But then in late 1990, everything started to unravel. They decided to hold up a, a security van in Rygate in Surrey. Um, what they didn't realise was that one of their associates had tipped off the police, who in fact encouraged the entire robbery to still go ahead. On the 27th of November, two of the gang set off. They tracked the security van on its way to Rygate. The van was carrying large amounts of money to branches of Barclays Bank. Mehmet and Dennis Arif were on the job themselves, along with Dennis's brother-in-law and a hardened armed robber called Kenny Baker. They all tooled up with an assortment of guns. But unknown to them, the police were all on red alert. The Securicor van had become the bait and the Arifs the catch. In the center of Rygate, the Securicor van pulled over and came to a halt. The security van has stopped. The man and woman security guard have got out uh, to go and get a coffee. And the Arifs and their friends swoop. And they swoop with a vengeance. They were wearing um, Ronald Reagan masks, which must have been absolutely terrifying, because the police have turned up. Because, of course, they knew about it. They were waiting. Um, they were there. Uh, planning to nick them all. This was in commuter belt town south of London. The police are not going to let go. They're going to get this mob if whatever happens. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the other robbers, Baker, was shot dead. The Arras were nicked, um, and this was a pivotal moment for them. It was a pivotal moment because it was the beginning of the decline of the Arifs, because it broke the family up in a way they'd never been broken up before. Mehmet and Dennis, together with their brother-in-law, Anthony Downer, were arrested. Kenny Baker lay dead. It was a massive dent in the Arifs' gang and a major breakthrough for the police but they could never have anticipated the violence which would soon follow. Alice Diamond was no stranger to violence. Standing at five foot eight, she was tall for the 1920s, and her diamond-studded fist could punch harder than a man's. Her all-girl gang, the 40 Thieves, were the most successful shoplifting operation ever. I've come to meet historian and author Lorraine Gammon. Her book, Gone Shopping, studies one of Diamond Annie's apprentices, Shirley Pitts. We're standing outside of one of their theatres of operation just off Oxford Street. How did you get to find out about the 40 Thieves? Well, what happened, I took down the life story of a professional thief. Nice to meet her here to take down, you know, chapters of in her life. And it turns out that she was trained, if you can use that word, by Alice Diamond. I think that what happened was that Shirley, you know, she was only 12, her dad had bought outfits for her, and they weren't right. And Alice offered to take her out shoplifting to get the right fit. 
And Shirley was just so impressed. Evidently, she was a very striking woman. You know, she had big fur coats, big hair, big makeup. And after the war... This, this is, is Alice. This is Alice, about 1947. You know, things were very dull. So I think Shirley was, um, you know, thrilled to be taken out by Alice and taught the trade. But tell me about Alice. What do you know about her? What kind of a character was she in the 20s? And why did she become queen of the 40 Thieves? Well, I, I think what happened is she was from a crime family. And so you have to remember that poverty was part of the motivation. Like, there wasn't a welfare state. People were poor. And they looked to find ways to make money. And shoplifting was something that Alice could do. And she had all the connections to make it work. So she could sell the clothes she stole. She could get lots of people to go with her and work with her. Right. And she was quite a forceful person, I gather. I do think that what was really interesting, they were like the first Avon ladies. They had these networks. And they just sold crooked gear, not cosmetics, you know. And they networked through their friends and relatives, through the, through the women, actually. So the guys might have turned up in the pub and made the deal with Alice. Once she'd gone to meet, you know, the wives and girlfriends, then they had a, a network set up, almost. So if you have a gang who are going out every day, I mean, the amounts are staggering, really, what a very small group yeah. of prolific offenders can actually steal. And I think what is... What is interesting and, and somewhat exciting about this gang is that they're not stealing to make money to buy drugs or anything. They are stealing to look more glamorous and to live better and, uh, and, and to maybe raise their social status. I think that's absolutely right. With Shirley's account, you know, she talked about seeing for the first time the toilets in Selfridges. You know, there she is in her uh, schoolgirl's outfit with, you know, straw bloater as a decoy so the 40 Thieves can try clothes on her. And she finally goes to the toilet and she said it was wonderful. It was all glass and beautiful soap and she wanted to live like that. So, yeah, they were aspirational, absolutely. Just like Fagin, you know, corrupted a network, Alice was able to do that too, but she was very organised and I think that we shouldn't underestimate the way she managed to mobilise them, almost like a female general. Sort of getting them on time, getting them in the car, making sure the, the boot was packed to sufficient amounts. Right. The Elephant Boys saw her as the perfect candidate to lead their female army of shoplifters. In 1916, age 20, Alice Diamond became queen of the 40 Thieves and would transform them. Dressed in specially tailored clothes complete with hidden pockets, Diamond and her crew raided some of the West End's biggest stores. Debenhams, D.H. Evans, Selfridges and Whiteley's. Diamond's girls dressed smart. They never wore any stolen goods and they gave the impression they were cut from finer cloth. But underneath their glamorous outfits were hidden surprises. Their jackets had deep inside pockets to contain plundered goods. Tailored cummerbunds, muffs, skirts, and even hats sewn with hidden pockets. One key innovation was to wear extra voluminous knickers to hide their ill-gotten gains. And they had a name for the knickers, didn't Yeah, they? they were called hoisting knickers, like from to hoist. And so that's how they got the name the oysters. But that's what I like, the, because ho hoister becomes oyster if you drop the H. That's, the oyster knickers is great, I love that. I'm sure we could make them now. They liked to steal small, exclusive things. Then there was lingerie, silk, designer clothes, furs, leather goods. It all just vanished. How would they do a raid on, say, one of the shops here? Well, what would happen? They'd arrive probably by car and park somewhere sneaky. And the car was very important. It needed a big boot so they could go backwards and forwards and load up. And they would all carry identical type bags and gradually go in the shops one by one. The first two would start loading the gear. The next person to come in would swap the bag and take the others out. And so there's only one chance of one person being arrested, while the others gradually moved around them. And sometimes they'd create a distraction, so they'd pretend to faint or if they were taken ill, and then cause a big havoc in the, in the store. And so people were looking at the wrong thing. But actually, a lot, a lot of the technique was about rolling the stuff very small and packing it in. And you, you have to remember, nowadays, we have very different types of technology. We have CCTV. TV. Yeah. We have all sorts of detection networks. Then well, it was a free-for-all. And so the women were very good at, you know, in smaller places, crowding the place. So if it was the bag section, 
of Selfridges. If you've got 14 people in there and only two are stealing, that's right. quite a nice distraction. Right. That's why they were called the 40 Thieves, because there was a lot of them. But it wasn't robbery that would be Alice's downfall. In 1925, she took her gang to carry out a brutal attack on a male gang member she'd fallen out with. And this time, events would overtake her. 27th of November, 1990, a gang, including Dennis and Mehmet Arif, had ambushed a Securicor van that had pulled up on a garage forecourt in Reigate, Surrey. But the police had ambushed them, arresting three of the gang and leaving one of them, Kenny Baker, dead. Mehmet Arif pleaded guilty. Dennis and Mehmet were jailed for many years. The Arifs looked weakened, but then fractions between other rival gangs, the Brindles and the Dailies, and involving another member of the Arif family, began. The first incident kicked off in August 1990, when two associates of the Brindles threatened rival John Daly in the Queen Elizabeth pub in Woolworth. Now the Arifs joined in. They now set upon the Brindles. Cousin of Dogan Arif, drug dealer known as Turkish Abbey, lured a friend of the Brindles into a club basement and shot him. The tit for tat killings went on. Turkish Abbey became the next target. In March 1991, he walked with his bull terrier into the William Hill betting shop in Woolworth. A gunman was waiting for him. The gunman then squeezed off two rounds from his 9mm Browning. Abby pleaded with him not to kill him. He then grabbed the man from the shop, using him as a human shield, dragged him outside. He was shot again, this time in the back. Turkish Abbey staggered 400 yards to a friend's house on the King's Lake estate, where he's alleged to have whispered the names of his killers. He died shortly afterwards in hospital. Abby was like a son to the head of the Arif family. Revenge would be swift. Shortly afterwards, a well-known face was shot at the Arif's connoisseur club. He refused to say who had shot him, and apparently, even while he was in hospital, as he spewed up the bullet that had grounded him, he re-swallowed it to prevent any forensic tests. Such was the fear that the Arif spread across the manor. The police now moved in on Bakir Arif, the Duke. They believed Bakir's business was a front to supply heroin, and at last, they had the evidence. In 1999, tape conversations and photographs from their surveillance brought about a conviction of conspiracy to supply heroin worth 12 million pounds. Becky Arif, then 46 years old, was given 23 years. The downfall of Alice Diamond and her 40 thieves was also coming. Fractures began to open in the gang, and a squabble between two girls would escalate into a full-scale fight, spelling disaster for them. On the evening of the 19th of December, 1925, here at the site of the old Canterbury Social Club, two of Alice Diamond's 40 thieves, Mari Jackson and Bertha Tappenden, started to drunkenly throw insults at one another. Mari Jackson attacked Tappenden with a broken wine glass. It cut her face. And then Jackson's father, Bill Britton, joined in. He punched Bertha. So, Brian, we're on the cut at the moment where the, uh, where the argument first started. Yes. What started this row? Um, it was between two girls, Mari, Mari Jackson and uh, Bertha Tappenden. Did it happen in the street or...? No, inside the club. Inside the club. They got a row and there's... Uh, Bertha Tappan said at one stage, Mari called me a bad name. Her father grew up, threw a glass of stout over me and uh, she was hit in the face with a flying glass. Um, and Mari bit her finger. <laughs> so, and there was quite a brawl going on. But this doesn't seem the sort of split or brawl that would lead to such a riot. There must have been something else there going on. There must be something else there. I mean, the girls all knew each other and they all had... Were they their convictions? Many of them were linked together through their convictions, so they, they were all part of the same group. 
that's what made the Elephant Gang so strong was the fact that they were there were so many of them and they were such a tight knitted that's group. That's right. I, 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 it was fairly unusual, that, that sort of trouble amongst themselves. They usually would have fights with other people in other communities, but not amongst themselves. But this certainly led to Alice's downfall, really, didn't it? Well, it, it did, because the things simmered. and they, they, It was a few nights later, back in the same club, when the girls were drinking all night, up till about midnight. And then they left. And then when they left with uh, some of the men, they gathered up bottles and glasses and anything they could lay their hands on and started to march along the cut towards where Murray Jackson and her family lived. Alice Diamond led the drunken rabble to attack Murray Jackson's house, where she lived with her mother, Mary, and her father, Bill Britton. So, so just talk me through it, Brian, what happened when they got here? Well, the house was about here. Um, 30, 40, maybe more people crowded in this narrow street, all armed with bottles, bricks, all well bevied. But there would have been a lot of hangers on as well at the same time. But the house disintegrated in a way. All of the windows were smashed. Mari Jackson was asleep upstairs and said she was awoken by gunshots. She, oh. she heard pistol shots. Just her family living in this house? Just her family living on the two storeys. The gang broke open the door and Bill Britton and his wife Mary were on the other side of the door trying to keep it shut. And, and who uh, led the gang? Well, oh, was it Alice? Uh, Alice Diamond and Maggie Hughes right. and Gertrude Scully, right. yes. And I think it was the men that were trying to force the door open. And Britton was the other side and his wife trying to keep it shut. Well, they couldn't. I mean, the crowd just barged in and got inside. Bill Britton ran upstairs. I mean, well, he was chased from room to room and he was being slashed at with knives and maybe razors. His face was badly cut. His son, who was only 15 years of age, intervened and he was knocked down. And they had life preservers, didn't they? They had life preservers. I mean, so called, of course, because they knocked somebody out without killing them. So it was called a life preserver. This is, could be a rubber cosh, it could be anything. It was usually a chair leg or something like that. It could be anything or something they'd taken to the pub. The target seems to have been Bill Britton. That's, that's who they were after. Mari tried to rescue her father, one of the men, which was George Hughes, who was the brother-in-law of Maggie Hughes, um, had a gun, and he pointed it in her face and she collapsed. How did it come to an end? Well, the police were beginning to arrive. Bill Britton apparently had come out of the house or been led out of the house. His face was a mass of blood. It required 25 stitches or more to repair the damage. What about Alice? Alice got away. They all got away, but Mari Jackson gave names of people who were involved to the police. And was there a sense with this that the, the 40 thieves had been brought down? Yes. I mean, the, the police believed that they had cracked the gang at that time. They'd arrested Alice Diamond, who was definitely the queen of the 40 thieves at that time, and Maggie Hughes, who was a prolific thief and one of the leaders of the gang, and others. Alice Diamond, 28, of 99 Hales Buildings, Elephant and Castle, along with eight others, appeared in court. The prosecution stated that only the intervention of the police prevented the nine accused from being charged with murder. The future of the 40 thieves now hung in the balance. By the year 2000, three of the Arif gang were in jail. Burkia, the Duke, for 23 years, was trying to flood the streets with heroin. Mehmet and Dennis, only halfway through their sentences for the security van raid in 1990. But even inside Parkhurst, the Arif brothers still wielded their power. So we've got Dennis and Mehmet both went to Parkhurst, and also Duggan was put away. What was life like for them in there? Well, Dennis and Mehmet, when they got to Parkhurst, um a new world opened up for them in a sense. They were treated with great trepidation initially, and of course in Parkhurst were some of the real criminal legends of that time, including the great train robbers, yeah. um, and later the Brinks Mat robbers, etc. And they were running everything mm. through a combination of the fear factor and money. Because one mustn't forget, the Arifs had a lot of money, you know. Yeah. Most of the money that they stole was never recovered, and it was being reinvested all the time. So they used all of that, all of their resources, and they took it inside prison. 
The, one of the fallacies of, of prison is that for some reason you can't get hold of your money. Of course you can get hold of your money or people can be paid outside on your behalf for services you obtain or render inside prison. And both the Arabs who are in Parkhurst were reveling in this. I'm not saying that any of these staff members at Parkhurst were doing anything wrong, but the power and influence of the Arabs spread its tentacles across the whole block and probably throughout the whole of Parkhurst. Everyone knew they had money. Uh, they'd reinvested a lot of the money they got from drugs and robbery into legitimate businesses. Uh, so they were wealthy. And when people know you've got money in prison, you can get what you want. Alice Diamond and some of her elephants would soon have their own taste of prison. In court, they all pleaded not guilty. Alice Diamond claimed she was with her married sister all day on the night in question. Her father supported her alibi. But Alice and many of the 40 thieves were sentenced to 18 months in prison with hard labor. We know what happened to Alice. We know how, with the, with the after the riot, that she was in prison for a while. But then she came back out and continued with the forty thieves. What what, do you, what happened to really break that network up? Well, I think that you know after the post-war period, there were different opportunities, and the sort of bombed housing situation meant lots of people moved away. And I, I suppose the criminal networks continued, but they weren't all located in the same place because most of them were, wanted better bathrooms and wanted to go to the new house that would offer in different places. After the Second World War, with its most notorious members either dead or imprisoned, the influence of the elephants and the 40 thieves was wearing thin. Security in department stores had been improved, shoplifting became riskier, gentrification saw an end to the gangsters' stomping grounds. Remaining gang members moved out to the suburbs. It was the end of an era but another would soon begin. A new age of gangs was just around the corner. Alice Diamond passed on her skills to create the next generation of thieves. Alice Diamond suited Shirley Pitts, the up and coming future queen of the 40 thieves, who was the queen in the 1950s. Shirley Pitts. Shirley Pitts, who was a descendant from the Pitts family, who were one of the sort of gangs involved around the Elephant Castle. What happened to Alice? Alice died in about 1952. Respectably? Yes, uh, she died uh, in Lambeth, but according to one of her family, she'd lost the use of both arms. Um, her sister died from multiple sclerosis. I don't know if that runs in families, but it's quite possible that Alice had that at that time. What a thing for a shoplifter to it's, lose. It's ironic, yeah. Yeah. So although Alice Diamond had gone, her skills lived on with the new leader of the gang, Shirley Pitts. She started off by playing the part of an innocent schoolgirl. They told her not to speak, but they get her in a perfect, you know, private schoolgirl's uniform with straw bloater. And the point was to march her around and pretend to try on dresses against her. And as they put the hanger against her, that concealed their hands. And they were loading the bag up and they, they would be teasing her and, you know, conjoling her to wear these things. So I imagine that they had voices they could use. These, these, are, these are great actresses. Oh, absolutely. And Shirley always could do the madam. And she described Alice as having plenty of gyver. Do you know that phrase? No. Well, gyver is about having a lot of front and being very plucky, being sort of not scared. And she loved that they had the gyver, and I think she emulated that in her own career. When Shirley died, I mean, because things had moved on, she was buried in a frock that they'd stolen from Harrods. And the, the, the flowers on the side of the hearse that went past had gone shopping. I mean... That's priceless. Times moved on also for the Arifs. Some of them had a stab at going straight. When I came here 12 years ago to meet Doug and Arif, this particular building was a slot machine factory. I mean, they're not called one-armed bandits for nothing. And it was a thriving business. There were loads of people working here when I came in here. Uh, Doug and took me into his office. It was beautifully furnished. He was smoking a cigar. He seemed like a man without a problem in the world. But what's interesting is that it's still here, the building. But more interesting than all of that was Duggan was very proud of the fact there was no 
cul-de-sac sign at the end of the road telling you it was a dead end. I noticed that as we drove in. Yeah, he loved that. He used to say people would drive down here and they didn't even realise it was a dead end, and that was the way he liked it, because it meant he had them trapped. So what about now? Are they around still, or has it all gone quiet? They're all out of prison now. Uh, it hasn't gone quiet in the real sense, but they've reinvested a lot of their funds into other businesses. Two of them, at least, are now based in, back in northern Cyprus, where the family came from originally. Uh, and they've even dipped their toes into things such as timeshare resorts in northern Cyprus. Uh, and they have very strong connections still and businesses on the mainland of Turkey. There's no doubt that beneath the surface, just round here, they have some influence, yeah. but it's nowhere near the level it used to be. It's incredible to think that just 30 to 40 years ago, there were vast areas of London controlled by four brothers. Yeah. And now we're talking about little satellite criminal gangs operating in streets, just streets alone, not, not even boroughs. Um, and they are not likely to ever spread their wings in the same way that the Arabs or any of the others, like the Richardsons and the Crays, did before them. Violent armed and dangerous. The Arifs would take on an armed robbery as well as running a massive drugs importation business. Unlike today's gangland, fractured by postcode territories and paranoia and division, the Arifs were the last of the old-style London gangsters. They aimed big, they worked as a group, people knew who they were and they feared them. In 2008, an illicit message sent from inside a British prison orders the murder of a teenager in Sheffield. A supposed traitor becomes a marked man. Same city, the year 1925, 83 years earlier, and a brutal beating leaves a man dead. It's the first gangland murder Sheffield has ever seen. It sends a shockwave through the city, earning it the title of Little Chicago. We'll be looking at two murders, both shocking, both caused by violent gang feuds. We'll see how a giant gambling empire split to create Sheffield's gangland. And how that continues to this day, played out with guns in backstreet turf wars. We'll be finding out what triggers such violence and the measures the police have taken to break the cycle of crime. Sheffield may not be the first city that comes to mind when you think of gang crime, but like many parts of the UK, the city has a history of gangs stretching back generations. At the time of the First World War, gangs in Sheffield didn't make their money from drugs or protection rackets, but from this, the game of pitch and toss. You place three coins on the ends of your fingers and then toss them. Tails, tails, heads. Believe it or not, betting on this became big business for the gangs of Sheffield, beginning a turf war which continues today. But what allowed a simple game of chance to take such a firm hold of the city? The slums of Sheffield in the 1920s were some of the worst in Great Britain. Even the writer George Orwell said, this was the ugliest town in the world. 15,000 overcrowded back-to-back -back houses with poor shared sanitation made the city a hellhole. To the working classes without jobs, without prospects, and with very little money, there was just one pastime which provided a dim ray of hope, pitch and toss. It was illegal and controlled by gangs. Well, I've come up here to meet uh, J.P. Bean, who's the sort of local historian, social historian, has written a book about Sheffield gang wars. And um, I think he's going to tell me a lot about how the early gangs uh, began here in Sheffield, grew out of the poverty, and especially a man called George Mooney. 
JP. Hi. Hi, Hi. Gary. Yeah, good to meet you. Good to meet you. You too. How are you doing? Good. So, uh, where is it? Up here. We're on Mason. We're on Manor Lane Road. Wonderful. Great graffiti. Original Sheffield art. <laughs> JP is taking me up to the top of one of the hills overlooking the city. Today, it looks more like a golf course or a playing field, but back then, it was here that illegal betting took place. This is Sky Edge, an ideal place for pitch and toss, which one of the most simple forms of gambling, but here, vast sums were bet. A man called Jack White, who was a publican from Barnsley, was known to regularly bet 50 pounds on one single toss of the coin. Huge sum of money. In Huge sum of money. The organisers of the ring took four shillings in the pound as a toll. The toller ran the ring. George Mooney here was the toller. So somebody put a pound on, the pound went on the floor as the bet. Four shillings went in George Mooney's pocket. George Mooney became the leader of a highly profitable organisation. But all gambling outside of horse racing was illegal. Sky Edge was the perfect place. Because it was high, they could have lookouts all the way round to warn of impending visits by the police. I see. Uh, they were known as pikers. Piking is a local term for looking. First sign of the police, the whistle would go up, they'd be away. So Scattered. how many men from the city would be up here, do you think, at 200, one time? 200, 300. In the First World War, it was very, very popular. So there was only one man tossing the coins? The man tossing the coins was known as the tosser. Mooney was the toller, and the ponter, who was armed with a stick, kept order around the so ring. It's very theatrical. One guy standing here, hundreds of people surrounding him. He's tossing the coins. People are shouting loudly. Absolutely. There's and people making, over there looking out for the police. And making side bets, as well as shouting loudly. On the outskirts, on the edge there, and all around. And because Sky Edge was such a good vantage point, Mooney's men rarely got caught. And even if they did, the highest fine was only 40 shillings when it was possible to make 40 pounds in a day. Mooney's empire was making a fortune from miners and steel workers. But when the First World War ended, steel production ceased. Mooney's takings dropped dramatically. George Mooney wanted to keep hold of as much money as he could, so he slimmed down his operation. He got rid of all the scouts and minders, including his top henchman, Sam Garvin. This was a move that would have serious consequences. That all rebounded upon him because Sam Garvin, who organised the park men, the men from the park district of Sheffield, and they became rivals of the West Bar people led by Mooney. And what was that gang called? The Park Brigade. They were known as the Park Brigade, and they fought back for the right to run the tossing ring. And thus began the Sheffield Gang Wars in April 1923. The feuds between the Moonies and the Park Brigade would push gang warfare in Sheffield to a new level of violence, earning the city the name of Little Chicago. It became the forerunner of the Turf Wars, which threaten the city today. Same city nearly a hundred years on, and another gang splits up, creating two opposing and violent groups locked in a bloody vendetta. The gang is called the S3, named after the postcode of the area where they live. The S3 was already a violent gang. He had an ongoing feud with the S4 gang, which led to three murders in 18 months. A police dossier chronicled at least 40 occasions in which the two gangs opened fire on each other. But now, a violent rift started within the S3 gang itself. So the S3 area covers two districts, Pittsmore and Burngreave, splitting the S3 gang into two separate factions. Both sides are fighting to control their drug selling territories. But what's more important to them is to reinforce their reputations. To understand the makeup of this culture and this city, I've enlisted the help of Alan McCauley, 
principal lecturer in politics and sociology at Sheffield's Hallam University. He's going to take me on a tour of the city. But at the moment, we're in a, you know, a system of cutbacks. Yeah. It's understanding the gangs in Sheffield is a mixture of politics, of social issues, of drug culture, also of understanding young men in the 21st century. And yeah. you know, a lot of them feel almost bypassed. Because of that, you get distortions where, you know, if you and I fell out, we probably wouldn't talk to each other for a few weeks. We certainly wouldn't try and stab each other or ultimately shoot us. It's about you have, in some cases, disrespected me. And in some of the cases, stabbed or uh, defigured someone. So it's then a revenge for that. And it's about a reputation that's built up both by word of mouth, but now particularly through social media, through Facebook and all the rest of it. And that is increasingly playing a role in keeping these feuds going on longer. So even in, in a kind of modern society, they've become isolated and have become outside the norms of Britain in the 2000s. A lot of them have friendships going back years. In fact, some of the S3 people were friends from the ages of four and five, apparently then fell out over relatively trivial issues, sometimes over a small amount of drug debts, which can, in some cases, be as small as 50 quid. So they're not making any money, no, these guys? No, they're disorganised criminals. They're dealing in relatively small amounts of cannabis, crack cocaine, occasionally heroin, although not very often. Their, their disorganisation has led to levels of violence that are probably unheard of. A teenager in Sheffield was building his reputation in Pittsmore S3, but he became targeted by the rival faction. It would be fatal. Around lunchtime on Friday, July the 11th, 2008, he went into French's Barbers, which stood on the corner of Spittle Street. It was the last haircut he would ever have. Little Chicago was about to show its ugly face. Many disputes begin with a real or perceived breach of street etiquette that slights a gang member's reputation. Members are expected to defend their reps, their reputations, and the most minor incidents can escalate into feuds. In 2008, the teenager was 17 years old. Gifted, popular, and generous, he came from a respectable middle-class family but despite his upbringing, he became drawn into the street action of the S3 area. It's alleged he had a street pitch to sell cocaine. A composer of rap music, he even boasted in one of his raps that, I can cause more chaos than World War II. But the S3 territory that he liked to be seen in had become divided. Tensions on his turf were running high and now about to erupt into violence. It all started when one half of the S3 gang accused him of giving away the whereabouts of a cousin of theirs, resulting in him being knifed almost to death. They were now about to teach him a lesson. After following him for one week, the gang were ready to strike. hours of Sunday the 6th of July, he was ambushed outside his home. Here, he was attacked and webbed, which meant being given a stabbing, seven times in the legs and lower body. The knife narrowly missed his organs. He managed to stagger home, and he was rushed to hospital. Then, once he'd been treated in hospital for fairly serious injuries, you know, uh, I think he, you know, he had a perforated liver and things like that, which was pretty bad stuff. Came out after a week, and within a day or so, he was back here in the centre of what is, you know, the the area where these gangs operate. Just three days after leaving hospital, he was ready to go out and show his face again and rebuild his rep. But this time, he carried a gun for protection. He made his way back into S3 territory and headed for Spittle Street in Pittsmoor. A 
and there was no better way to reinforce his rep than first sharpen up his haircut. French's Barbers was a popular place to hang out and be seen. He left the Barbers and was confronted by three hooded figures. He took out his black handgun, but raised his arm too late. He was blasted in the back from close range with a sawn-off pump-action Beretta shotgun. So you were here the day of the murder. Can you tell me what you found when you first got here? Yeah, chaos, really. Uh, it was completely sealed off by the police. Uh, there were officers all around this corner here. Uh, a lot of onlookers who, you know, were obviously shocked and aware that something major had happened here in broad daylight. This is the actual shot where he was yeah. uh, when the two guys came, opened the door and essentially called him out onto the street. He came out of the shop and was shot in the back here on the street. But when he came back here, mm. he was holding a gun, wasn't he? That's right, yeah. He was aware that he was marked in some way and he felt that he needed to have some manner of defending himself. But it's kind of a, it's kind of a brazen comment, isn't it, to say, here I am and I'm not going to be pushed away even though I've been stabbed? I think it's the bravado that is endemic. Yeah amongst, in this kind of culture, you know, amongst these kind of lads. They, they do not want to lose face. Uh, and I think that's, you know, his father said, I just wish he could have just let it go. But of course he couldn't because it was about being out there. You know, he was on the internet making, you know, claims about himself and he was well known. He was a rapper, all this kind of stuff. And he had a name on the street by that point. And of course, when you live in that culture, you have got to defend that name, I think. And that is what he was doing with the gun in his pocket. He was defending his reputation. <laughs> 80 years earlier, George Mooney was defending his gambling empire. In the 1920s, the Mooney gang split and the Park Brigade emerged as a more ruthless bunch led by Sam Garvin. Garvin was a bookmaker, gambler, and promoter of bare-knuckle boxing matches. He had amassed a string of convictions and prison sentences for assault, illegal gaming, contracts, and larceny. Garvin was a professional criminal, first conviction in 1904, very well connected with local politicians. When the first very decent council houses were built in Sheffield, he got one, and there weren't many of them. In the depths of the Depression, when everybody's living in poverty, he drove, a, he drove a three litre Bentley saloon. Garvin's Park Brigade quickly ousted the Moonies and took over control of the pitch and toss. Now the Moonies were out for revenge. A series of violent tit for tat attacks followed. They attacked one of the Park Brigade in his bed, a man called Bill Furness, one Saturday night in April 1923. attacked him with hammers, severely injured him, never reported to the police, but there were reprisals. A few days later, one of the park brigade was coming away from here, away from the tossing ring, and was slashed with razors over a hundred times. Walked down that road there, the road with the graffiti, staggered down there with his head caved in, covered in blood. Hundred razor slashes found on him at the infirmary wouldn't speak to the police, wouldn't say who'd done it. All he'd say was, I reckon they've spoiled me suit. <laughs> I reckon they had spoiled his suit. They had spoiled his suit. <laughs> but the vendetta between the two gangs would culminate in the most violent attack Sheffield had ever seen. It would be an innocent man, a non-gang member called William Plummer, who was going to experience just how ruthless Sam Garvin's park brigade could be. 
So here we are, Princess Street, scene of the murder of William Plummer. So tell me about William Plummer. Who, who was he? What did he do? William Plummer was a 34-year-old Scotsman. He'd come to Sheffield after the First World War to work in the steelworks. Father of three children, he had no connection whatsoever with gangs. Then how did Plummer get involved? The night before he was murdered, there was a fight, an altercation between a man called Liversidge and Wilfred Fowler. Fowler was? Wilfred Fowler was one of Sam Garvin's gang. Plummer and his wife and others went along to ensure fair play in this fight between Liversidge and Fowler. Liversidge knocked Fowler to the ground and generally got the better of him. Fowler was injured. Plummer helped him up. And instead of being grateful for that, Fowler said to him, Jock, you're going to pay for this. Um, despite the fact that he'd had nothing to do with the fight at all and he'd helped him off the ground. I see. So because one of his lads had been beaten, Sam Garvin was affronted. The old gangster pride or whatever, control. And Garvin rounded up a group of men they came down here the following night, the end of April 1925, to look for Plummer. They were breathing fire, they talked of murder, they talked of blood flowing down the streets. It was clear that there was going to be trouble, serious trouble, and indeed there was trouble. Plummer came out of his house down there at number 42, walked down here to the corner, and he said, I'll fight you one by one. They didn't want to know about that. Gangs don't work like that, do they? They all jumped upon him. Around 20 of Garvin's men hit Plummer with pokers, coshes, a piece of lead on a string, and this vicious weapon, ironically called a life preserver, a chair leg with nails in it. Although being badly beaten, Plummer managed to crawl back to the house, but as he struggled towards the door, he was then pounded repeatedly with a child scooter. Plummer had severe head injuries, and two great wounds resembling bayonet thrust through his stomach and side. He was taken to the Royal Infirmary, where he died within minutes. There'd been slashings, there'd been shootings, there'd been bludgeonings, but he was the first man to be killed. It was the first murder of the Sheffield Gang Wars. But it wouldn't be the last. The attack on William Plummer in 1925 was one of the most vicious Sheffield had ever seen. Garvin's gang of up to 20 men, including Wilfred and Lawrence Fowler, had beaten Plummer and killed him. But what of these perpetrators? The gang dispersed. The Fowler brothers, Wilfred and Lawrence Fowler, both members of the Park Brigade of Sam Garvin's gang, they lingered. When the first police officer arrived, the Fowler brothers were sitting on the chip shop steps. Lawrence Fowler the police officer said, what's happened? Lawrence Fowler said, I hit him on the head. He admitted it? Well, he said, I hit him on the head. The police officer said, be careful, it looks like being serious, as they were going to the police station. And Fowler said, all right, then I didn't hit him on the head. <laughs> These were not the brightest of men. But the leader of the gang, Sam Garvin, was much sharper. What he'd done, he'd stirred up all the violence here, and then just before it happened, just before the assault on Plummer, on the corner there, he'd hopped on a tram, got off in the wicker in Sheffield and assaulted the first man he saw, who just happened to be an old pal of Mooney's. So he recognised him. And thereby, effectively, gave Sam Garvin an alibi. But this ploy didn't work. Sam Garvin was rounded up, along with nine other suspects, including the Fowler brothers. They were taken to West Bar Police Station. Sheffield Fire and Police Museum, and this is 
This is one of the sort of police cells that uh, the families would have been brought to after yeah. the murder. This is the old West Bar police station, only a hundred yards from where George Mooney lived, right. right in the heart of Mooneyland. And you've got your tiles, the wooden bench on which they slept, a wooden pillow, old blankets. Many times, many gangmen would have been brought here. In all, 10 men stood accused of murdering or aiding the murder of William Plummer, including the Fowler brothers, as well as Sam Garvin, the Park Brigade boss. This single investigation exposed the whole criminal network. It was an alarming glimpse into a lawless city. It called for urgent action. Sheffield had always had a very small police force, just 556 men to police a population of over half a million. But now this would change because the Sheffield gangs would come under attack from two new forces. The first of these hit the streets just four days after William Plummer's murder. It was the Flying Squad. The local authorities were under pressure. They'd be, been ignoring the issues for a couple of years. It became apparent that they were going to have to do something. The police formed a special duties squad, colloquially known as the Flying Squad. There were four men, all First World War veterans, all not averse to fighting, not averse to violence, took the war to the gangs. Now Sheffield would take another swipe at the gangs. They appointed a new chief constable. He would become Britain's first gangbuster. His name was Percy Silito. Age 38, Silito was an unorthodox choice. He'd left England to become a trooper in the African police, working in a tough and brutal regime which kept control over native tribes. Now, back in England, Silito would apply the same methods. He got on with the magistrates. He knew the name of every police officer in the force. He was great for building people's morale up. He backed them up to the hilt. No matter what they did, he supported them. They knew that they could go out and take war to the gangs and that the chief constable would be right behind them. So why was this any different to the police force before? They were bigger guys. They were bigger guys and they went out, they went to publicans and they told them don't serve gang members. If you serve gang members, we'll oppose your license. If they saw gang members in the pubs, they hauled them out and battered them. Really? There were no, there, yes, there, were, there, were, there was no human rights. So this was just there. another gang, really? Effectively, they'd be fire with fire, steel with steel, yeah. So do we know any of these characters? There was six foot four inch Walter Loxley. Now Walter Loxley was a bit of a local legend all his life, really, because of what happened in the gang troubles. There was a famous occasion where a defendant was in court accused of assaulting Loxley, but the defendant was far smaller than him and covered in blood and bandages and whatever. And his solicitor said to the magistrate, Your Worships, this should not be a case of assaulting the police, it should be a case of attempted suicide. Silito brought in men like PC Pat Geraghty, who stood six foot five and could hold seven tennis balls in one hand. Silito also introduced the European Jiu Jitsu champion Harry Hunter to train the force in self defense. After seven weeks, each man could deal with 60 methods of attack. The flying squad <laughs> threw people through windows, they threw them through doors without opening them first, they battered people in public view. They, didn't, they took them around the back occasionally, but they, they didn't take any prisoners if they, need, if they didn't need to. On one occasion, they battered a guy in a pub and the landlady fainted. This is what Sheffield Police were presented with on the afternoon of July the 11th, 2008. A hooded teenager lying in a pool of blood outside a barber's shop, a handgun lying nearby. As if to emphasize the scale of the problem, police in Sheffield said this afternoon that a 17-year-old shot dead at a barber shop yesterday was probably himself carrying a firearm. Did the police pick up any leads or, uh, you know? It was very difficult for the police. People just do not want to assist them with their inquiries. You know, they, they just find themselves up against a brick wall, essentially, a lot of the time. Things just close down, you know. But then the police got a break, which changed the momentum of their inquiry. 
The investigation began to make progress. A shotgun was found near the barber's shop hidden in Oscarthorpe Park. It was later proved to be the murder weapon. Eventually, witnesses came forward and named the gang members. But the real breakthrough came when they discovered that one of the gang had a cousin in East Yorkshire, in the Wolds Prison. The police realised that, you know, there was some communication between this guy in prison and the, and the guys on the outside. How did they establish that? I think it was essentially they started to look at cell site analysis, which is where the police check where a phone has been at a certain time, and they can then check which phone that phone is calling. So they were able to check the phones of the guys on the outside and realise there was a pattern of calls to a, this particular number. Who were the guys that were speaking? There was a guy in, inside, Nigel Ramsey, who was known on the street before he was uh, convicted and sent to prison as the general. He had a cousin outside, Denzel Ramsey. They were exchanging phone calls. Nigel Ramsey had a mobile phone inside his cell at the Walter Prison. It's been estimated that there's a mobile phone, SIM card and phone charger for every 10 inmates across Britain. In one survey conducted in 2009, around 4,000 mobile phones and SIM cards were found. They're smuggled inside in numerous ways, in the soles of trainers like these, in milk cartons, in books, washing powder, even in food. You name it, it's been done. How would you have got that? It's thought that it was smuggled in on somebody or thrown over a wall and picked up. So Nigel Ramsey, the general, yeah. sanctioned the killing. That's right. It's thought that he decided that because of his treachery, he would, he would have to be killed. Issued the, uh, the, the order over his mobile phone from prison and that was that. In 2008, one cell at Wold's prison in East Yorkshire was occupied by Nigel Ramsey, known as the General. He was one of the leaders of the rival S3 gang in Sheffield. Ramsey had been sent to prison for armed robbery and holding up a post office. But this didn't prevent him from organizing the murder of a teenager in Sheffield. Just over one year after, the case came to trial at Sheffield Crown Court. What was the atmosphere like around the trial? It was very tense. You can feel the, the emotion and the animosity there. These were guys who had been part of the same gang who had then split apart. So the tension there was, was palpable, really, between the, between the two groups. There were armed police stationed outside this court building because of concerns. After five days of deliberations on August the 7th, 2009, a jury found four men guilty of murder. The judge sentenced 23-year-old Nigel Ramsey, the general, to a minimum of 35 years in prison for instigating the murder. 21-year-old Michael Chatu, who pulled the trigger, was given 30 years. 20-year-old Denzel Ramsey, 25 years. And 17-year-old Levan Menzies, 20 years. Sentencing, Mr Justice Griffith Williams said, Britain is not broken, although certain communities are being plagued by the lawless activities of the likes of you and gangs such as the S3. I make it clear that to protect them, the full rigour of the law must be brought to bear and rogues like you must be brought to book. Two members of the gang laughed and joked with each other as the sentences were handed down. They actually cheered and jeered and, and kind of shook their fists at the, at the public gallery. And people in the gallery were actually shouting back down at them. It was like a, uh, it was almost like a, a triumph. Like, well, yeah, I've got 25 years, you know, I'll do it. And like an achievement almost. In the late 1920s, Gang warfare in Sheffield had caught national attention. The murder of William Plummer had shocked the nation. Over 8,000 people attended his funeral. They were visibly protesting against the violence that was plaguing their streets. The murder trial of William Plummer's attackers 
opened on Tuesday, July the 28th, 1925. Ten men stood accused of William Plummer's murder. The crucial issue was who had struck the fatal blow. The bayonet wound Plummer received had killed him, and although the bayonets was never found, Wilfred Fowler was seen jabbing Plummer with it. There were 80 witnesses in all, 50 who had been at the scene, another 30 of medical, forensics, whatever people. Um, all travelled over to Leeds for four days, four-day trial before Mr Justice Finlay. And at the end of it, Wilfred and Lawrence Fowler were found guilty of murder. Three other men were found guilty of manslaughter and got penal servitude. It's, it's hard to imagine because they were all involved in the beating yeah. of this man, and yet only two of them get accused, of, get found uh, guilty of murder. A handful, literally a handful of all the witnesses um, said they saw Wilfred Fowler with a bayonet. Others said they'd seen Lawrence Fowler hitting Plummer with a truncheon. They were the two key ones in the whole melee, I guess. After the trial, both Wilfred and Lawrence Fowler were sentenced to death by hanging. Although Sam Garvin, the leader of the Park Brigade, was not involved in Plummer's murder, he did assault a man when he tried to create his alibi, and for that, he got 20 months. But what happened to his arch rival, George Mooney? George Mooney went to jail for biting a man's ear off on a train coming back from a race meeting. Hungry, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's on a ear diet. Right. Uh, several of the other principals in both the old Mooney gang and the more recent Park Brigade were in jail. So even before the Second World War started, they were all dissipated? It was all done and dusted by 1927. By that time, the heavy-handed tactics used by Percy Silito and the Flying Squad quickly turned the city around. The crimes of the Mooney Gang and the Park Brigade were brought to an end. Soon, newspapers were reporting success after success as Sheffield's gangs were eliminated. Many said that the Flying Squad were no better than the gangs themselves, but no one doubted their effectiveness. The murder of William Plummer shocked Sheffield and was a wake-up call for all police forces. It highlighted the horrific nature of gang warfare and its irrational, uncontrolled violence. That same horror confronted the teenager's family in 2008. Our son used to have lots of friends, and his main mistake was that he trusted some of those who he should not have trusted. They handed him the death sentence, and for his family and friends, the life sentence. It's such a waste of young life, thrown away all because of dented pride. I want to find out if Sheffield is going to be able to solve this deep-rooted problem. So tell me about uh, the future for Sheffield. We've certainly seen a fall off in public gang activity since the shootings. The police have been a much more high profile. There's been much more investment going on that the, the city council has developed with its youth services a gang strategy, which does appear to have made a real difference. But the police have taken a much more interventionist approach. They've now been targeting individuals using warrants to arrest people and basically using much more intelligence-driven policing, I think, which has resulted in a fall off in activity. And I think also some of the peripheral people involved in the gangs walked away at that point as well. Yeah. You know, the ones who began to think, well, you know, it might be him today, but it could be me tomorrow. Over the last eight years, 10 lives were lost in gang violence in the city. A long-running police operation targeting drug and gang crime led to more than 50 arrests, with more than 200 police officers taking part in the raids. Today in Sheffield, there's a number of new initiatives to steer young people away from gangs. One of these is called Zest for Sport. Sheffield particularly has problems with the, the 
the old postcode gangs, as they're sort of referred to, um, particularly the S3, S6 gangs, um, gangs within inner city areas of Sheffield. Um, they are present, they do go on. Um, however, they tend to be more serious crime, which fortunately our young people are not involved in. We're in um, what's called the central ward of Sheffield, just outside Sheffield city centre, which is a deprived inner city area of Sheffield. Through some of the activities that we do here at Zest, we've been successful in reducing low levels of antisocial behaviour by 50%. Um, we work closely with the police on that. I've experienced stuff in South Africa that can then benefit these kids. They've asked me a lot about my experiences and tried to compare gang culture, like how kids respond to sport in South Africa, how, you know, how the cult culturally it's different. And I think that, you know, it's important for them to learn about that aspect as well and to, to realise, you know, the great opportunity they have at Zest because I've worked with gangs on the streets, I've worked in South Africa, I've worked in extreme poverty and I've seen how much things can mean to people. And I think before that time that I told them, it was as though they'd taken off you know, their tinted glasses and realised, oh, actually. The centre aims to provide a base for young people to come together rather than be divided by race, culture or class. And more importantly in this city, to break down the borders that exist between different areas and territories. We work together to break down the barriers so that young people can feel that they can leave their sort of territory areas and go into other areas and feel safe to do so. Young people like to affiliate with a group and that can be in a positive way and it can lead, unfortunately, to in a negative way. But I think more and more young people aren't given the opportunity that really that they need and that they crave. In very few communities do they have a place to go that's safe, that they can access. Unfortunately, young people are being forced to grow up very quickly, um, which is very difficult on them. It's a huge amount of pressure now to be a young person. In, you know, in South Africa, you're dealing with quite high-level gang, um, gang crime, gang violence on the streets, and a lot of the kids that you work with are involved in that, whereas here, they see it as something to go out and play around in, whereas there is something that when you come onto the streets, you're in a gang, you know, you have to choose, whereas here, kids have choices, and that's what I try and tell them, you know, I say to them, You've got education, you've got a family at home, you've got all these you know, brilliant activities to get involved with and still some people stand there and say, well, I want more. And I think that that's where they need educating in, in terms of you know, the vast opportunities that are available to them. In 2008, the murder was a frightening insight into a culture where carrying a knife or a gun with intent to use it had become a shocking normality. Violence is something which is learned, so it can also be unlearned. The Sheffield Police now work with young offenders to break the cycle of crime by behaviour change, with great success. Violent crime in Sheffield has declined, and gun crime has fallen. Over the course of this series, we've been looking at gangs, old and new, from across some of Britain's cities. Gangs have risen and fallen. They prosper now as they've always done. They continue to find new ways of making money and fending off their rivals. We've seen how you joined gangs, how they operated, what they stood for. We've learned how they've moved from gambling into clubs and protection, and now into drug importation and dealing. But is there a pattern to criminality? Are there similarities between these gangs? Or are they solely products of their era? We're going to look at the reasons why we have gangs, how they make their money, how they hold on to it, and what has been done to try and break them. Gangs have always been with us, and it's easy to see why. They offer self-preservation, comradeship, a sense of belonging. For some, joining a gang means prestige, and for a few, it means power. But there are countless reasons beyond the pack instinct why people join gangs. 
In the 19th century, living in one of Britain's industrial cities, it was an alternative family, a home on the street away from the overcrowded slum. The gang could also give you respect, but that you'd have to earn. On the streets of Manchester in the late 1800s, you could earn respect as a scuttler. Long before there were hoodies and scallies, there were the scuttlers, the first youth cult. I'm about to meet a man who I hope can tell me a little bit about them. Andrew Davis is a historian and author who has researched the gangs of Manchester. So, Andrew, tell me about the scuttlers. What, what were the scuttlers? The scuttlers were, were gang members. They were, they were young lads, working class lads, aged in their teens, more or less from the age of leaving school up to sort of 20. 21 and scuttler was a very, a very specific term it, it meant you were a gang member it meant you had a certain look it's a slang term with its origins on the streets so what would they do were they would they be stealing or were they ru running gambling or scotland gangs really are, are territorial gangs their neighborhood or, or street gangs and really they're fighting gangs rather than criminal gangs they're usually named after the street, maybe the, the thoroughfare um, where they would gather on the corner. So it would be an area-based name. So you might have a gang from Hope Street, Salford. The most famous gangs had more exotic names. There was a gang from Ancoats from Bengal Street who went under the name the Bengal Tigers. Wow. So they're looking to invest a little bit of glamour, something exotic and in their activities. And is that all it was really about, sort of just respect and, um, uh, and power? It's, it's very much about pride in your area and it's about pride in yourself and your friends as well. So a lot of this is about keeping young people from other districts outside what you define as your patch. Scuttlers became the first youth cult. They had a distinctive look. Short hair but with a long fringe. Worn in a parting and plastered down with soap on the forehead over the left eye. Dress signalled to everyone that a scuttler was no ordinary working class lad, but a street fighter. It was one thing to look dandy and impressive, but some of their dress had other, more vicious functions. For example, these clogs, heavy, pointed, and with brass toe caps, good for close up combat. Their belts were another part of their armoury. They would have a heavy brass buckle, which they'd sharpen along the edge so it became like a blade. They'd also bang nails or bolts through the end to add more weight when swung. It was said that a hit from one of these could split a man's skull. And was the fighting just random, just people just getting angry and attacking people, or was this that there was an order to the way they fought? I think it's very, very targeted. One of the things that um, you realise about, about Scotland is they all know each other. The gangs would actually chalk the threat or, or the invitation to fight. They'd, they'd chalk the, the challenge either on a wall or maybe on the pavement. So there would be a day and a time, Saturday, 3 o'clock, Adelphi against Greengate. So it really is battling by appointment. They're very often carrying and they're using knives as well. But it's very, very rare that anybody gets killed. So generally what they're looking to do is to maim or to scar. The scuttlers fought for little but their own respect. They simply liked fighting. They liked proving how tough they were. They didn't make any money out of it. There was no master plan. But in other cities, street gangs could be very different. Glasgow was once the most overcrowded city in Britain, as well as the poorest. In the late 1800s, immigrants from Ireland, fleeing the second wave of the potato famine, came to work on Clydeside. They formed large Catholic neighbourhoods in the Protestant city. For many, their arrival was unwelcome competition and created resentment, hatred and, in some cases, violence. One area which became a flashpoint bordering Catholic districts was called Bridgeton or Brigton. And this was home to an infamous Protestant gang, the Brigton Boys, soon to be known as the Billy Boys. They took their name from William of Orange, the Dutch-born king who in the 17th century annexed Northern Ireland and installed the Protestant church. The Billy Boys were devotees of King Billy. Legend has it that the gang was formed in 1924 by a man who came from this street. His name was William Fullerton. 
Billy Fullerton, who formed them, according to the story, was beaten up by a gang of Catholics when he was in his late teens, and he decided that he would form his own gangs uh, to basically anything they could do, he could do bloodier. In the 1930s, the rivalry between the Protestant and Catholic was played out on the football pitch, with the west of the town supporting Rangers and the east supporting Celtic. In spite of the weather, we saw Celtic trying their skill against the Rangers. Celtic kicked off and run straight into the attack. The Billy Boys use their loyalty to Rangers as a way of attacking Catholics. Ill trouble breaking out on the terraces here. They would infiltrate the Rangers fans to provoke battles with Celtic supporters. The sectarian gangs of Glasgow, like the Billy Boys, were not alone. Immigrants always faced opposition across Britain's cities. The Irish settled in Liverpool and also by the docks in London. But there wasn't just the Irish. Italian immigrants settled in Clerkenwell, Russian Jews in Whitechapel. And even today, there are still immigrant gangs around the country. Tensions could snap at any time. In Southall, West London, in 1976, they did just that, with the stabbing of an Asian student by a white gang. Young Asians who had put up with attacks from teddy boys now had to face much more powerful groups, like the National Front. The Asian community defended itself by forming gangs. I'm meeting up with a man who has done a lot of research into this, journalist and crime writer, Tony Thompson. First of all, tell me about, when did uh, gangs first emerge in this area? Well, around the Southall area, they really started around the late 60s, early 70s, which was around the same time that we started to get a large population of people from the Indian subcontinent coming to this part of London and setting up shop here. Uh, so, um, in the early days when they were being here, there was a lot of racism, a lot of uh, people being attacked by um, uh, sort of people like the National Front and so on. And uh, they started to defend themselves by gathering together in vigilante gangs to defend themselves against the racists. Uh, but what happened was once, once the threat from the racists started to fade a little bit, those gangs stayed around, started attacking each other and started preying on the local community themselves. And it was the same story in other cities. During the 1970s, the black community in Birmingham felt threatened. Just uh, tell me a bit about why gangs started in Birmingham. Well, originally the, the gangs, certainly the black and Asian gangs, uh, started off as, you could say, almost vigilante gangs. There was a, a big problem with skinheads and the right wing in certain parts of Birmingham, and these gangs formed essentially to look after their own communities. But in 1981, tensions exploded in vicious race riots. Heavy-handed policing only inflamed the aggression on the streets, as groups of young black youths began to take the law into their own hands. It kind of empowered a lot of the young black kids and that they thought, well, hang on, we've rioted, we managed to put the police on the back foot, you know, we, we can show some force when we want to. Eventually, as the right-wing threat dissipated, they kept that organisation together and it became more of a criminal network. Yeah. As, as drugs started coming into the community, they used those bonds and those links they had um, and direct it towards criminal efforts instead. Once gangs have become established, it's not always easy to decommission them. What may have started as a means of protection can also become a means of making money. The revenues that can be brought in by using such a large number of loyal supporters can be too tempting to resist. During the First World War, times were tough. For many living in the northern cities, only the manufacture of armaments kept men in work. The wages they brought home were just enough to keep their families alive. Their future, what they could see of it, was bleak. Their only ray of hope in such depressed times was gambling. And in the city of Sheffield, that meant a game called pitch and toss. With local historian J.P. Bean, I've come to see where the gangs here in the 1920s made their money. This is Sky Edge, an ideal place for pitch and toss, which one of the most simple forms of gambling, but here, vast sums were bet. A man called Jack White, who was a publican from Barnsley, was known to regularly bet 50 pounds on one single toss of the coin. Huge sum of money. In Huge sum days. of money. The organisers of the ring took four shillings in the pound as a toll. The toller ran the ring. George Mooney here 
was the toller. So somebody put a pound on, the pound went on the floor as the bet. Four shillings went in George Mooney's pocket. Sheffield was not alone. There were pitch and toss rings all around the country. Gambling was big business. And in the 1920s, there was no greater gambling business than horse racing, turning over 500 million pounds a year. Racetracks became an industry for the gangs. And the biggest gang who made the most was an outfit from Birmingham called the Brummagem. After the First World War, racecourses were the only legal gambling places. But the bulging satchels of the bookmakers attracted criminal gangs wanting a piece of the action. And the Brummagems wanted the biggest slice. I've come to meet a former member of the Mets flying squad, police historian Dick Kirby. Dick. Gary, delighted to meet you. Yeah, so I suppose the first question is, you know, what did the Brummagems uh, see in racecourses? What, what, why were they here? Well, they saw an awful lot of money. In those days, before the First World War, practically anybody could set up as a bookmaker. Oh, right. There were no real rules and regulations, and uh, the bookmakers just paid out if they could afford it. Uh, and if they didn't, they hired bodyguards to protect them from enraged punters who wanted their winnings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Brummagems soon got into every illegal trick in the book, as historian Carl Chin explains. Blokes would go up to somebody and say, hey, to a bookie, you're the bookie. Oh, give us ten bob for poor old Fred, he's just come out of Nick. Right. Poor old Fred hadn't come out of Nick. Didn't poor old, poor old, Alf's just going into Nick, give us ten bob. I see. Or else even cruder. If you don't give me a pound, I'm going to turn you upside down. Right, right. So a lot of bookmakers hired minders, tough foxes. It was might rules. I see. And so whether you were bookmakers or punters, if gangs came along and preyed upon you, you were struggling. And the gang that posed the greatest danger and controlled the most racecourses was the Brummagems. The gang charged bookmakers as much as 50% of their profits for the privilege of being left unmolested. In turn, some of the bookies began to use the gang services to dissuade winning punters from pressing their claims for payment. You didn't have to run a national horse racing racket to make money. There was a living to be made out of good old honest thieving if a gang had enough men out on the street. And not all gang members were men. One gang called the 40 Thieves from South London was run by a formidable woman called Alice Diamond. In 1916, age 20, Alice Diamond became queen of the 40 Thieves and would transform them. Dressed in specially tailored clothes complete with hidden pockets, Diamond and her crew raided some of the West End's biggest stores, Debenhams, D.H. Evans, Selfridges and Whiteleys. Diamond's girls dressed smart. They never wore any stolen goods, and they gave the impression they were cut from finer cloth. But underneath their glamorous outfits were hidden surprises. Their jackets had deep inside pockets to contain plundered goods. Tailored cummerbunds, muffs, skirts, and even hats sewn with hidden pockets. One key innovation was to wear extra voluminous knickers to hide their ill-gotten gains. And they had a name for the knickers, didn't Yeah, they? they were called hoisting knickers, like from to hoist. And so that's how they got the name the oysters. But that's what I like, the, because hoister becomes oyster if you drop the H. That's, the oyster knickers is great, <laughs> I love that. I'm sure we could make them now. They like to steal small, exclusive things. Then there was lingerie, silk, designer clothes, Furs, leather goods, it all just vanished. How would they do a raid on, say, one of the shops here? Well, what would happen? They'd arrive probably by car and park somewhere sneaky. And the car was very important. It needed a big boot so they could go backwards and forwards and load up. And they would all carry identical type bags and gradually go in the shops one by one. The first two would start loading the gear. 
The next person to come in would swap the bag and take the others out. And so there's only one chance of one person being arrested, while the others gradually moved around them. And sometimes they'd create a distraction, so they'd pretend to faint or if they were taken ill, and then cause a big havoc in the, in the store. And so people were looking at the wrong thing. But actually, a lot, a lot of the technique was about rolling the stuff very small and packing it in. And you, you have to remember, nowadays we have very different types of technology. We have CCTV. TV. Yeah. We have all sorts of detection networks. Then it was a free-for-all. Some gangs were not as subtle as the 40 Thieves. One gang who came to prominence were certain members of a Turkish Cypriot family from southeast London. They were four brothers, Bakir, Mehmet, Dennis and Dogen. In the 80s, the Arabs were kings. They were running everything. They seemed to be getting away with everything. Even when they got nicked, they got off. But yeah, they, they really were becoming legendary figures. But then in late 1990, everything started to unravel. They decided to hold up a, a security van in Rygate in Surrey. Um, what they didn't realise was that one of their associates had tipped off the police, who in fact encouraged the entire robbery to still go ahead. On the 27th of November, two of the gang set off. They tracked the Securicol van on its way to Rygate. The van was carrying large amounts of money to branches of Barclays Bank. Mehmet and Dennis Arif were on the job themselves, along with Dennis's brother-in-law and a hardened armed robber called Kenny Baker. They all tooled up with an assortment of guns. But unknown to them, the police were all on red alert. The Securicor van had become the bait, and the Arifs, the catch. In the centre of Rygate, the Securicor van pulled over and came to a halt. The security van has stopped. The man and woman security guard have got out uh, to go and get a coffee, and the Arifs and their friends swoop, and they swoop with a vengeance. They were wearing um, Ronald Reagan masks, which must have been absolutely terrifying, because the police had turned up, because, of course, they knew about it. They were waiting. Um, they were there uh, planning to nick them all. This was in commuter belt town south of London. The police are not going to let go. They're going to get this mob if whatever happens. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the other robbers, Baker, was shot dead. The Arras were nicked, um, and this was a pivotal moment for them. It was a pivotal moment because it was the beginning of the decline of the Arras, because it broke the family up in a way they'd never been broken up before. Mehmet and Dennis, together with their brother-in-law, Anthony Downer, were arrested. Kenny Baker lay dead. Gangs made their fortune from just about every illegal practice going. But drugs were always going to bring in the most money. Drugs changed the face of gangland Britain. Some gangs, like the Tutti Nung, poured all their money into heroin. It all depended upon couriers, trusted friends or families from the gang, and usually women. They would be flown out of Heathrow to India or Pakistan. They would usually go for a few weeks and be able to visit their families and have a paid holiday. But on their return, they would bring back heroin. Boarding and body checks in Pakistan could be easily avoided. The gang wielded considerable power there. Officials could be bribed to turn a blind eye. But it was the return trip to Heathrow where the gang's ingenuity and planning would be critical. With vigilant customs officials and the latest scanning devices, it would be risky trying to smuggle the drugs through customs. But the Tutti Nung had a simple, undetectable and foolproof solution. When the couriers entered the baggage reclaim area, they would slip off to the ladies' toilets. There, they would remove the packages of heroin. Each courier had been given a key to the tampon dispenser. Here, the drugs were hidden, and the courier, now totally clean, could pass through customs and leave the airport. There was just one more link in the operation. 
the gang had people employed at the airport as cleaners. As soon as the couriers had cleared, their job was now to move and pick up the drugs. Once in their hands, it was no problem to take the drugs out of the airport. With so many people regularly going back and forth, nothing looked out of the ordinary. This operation didn't raise any suspicions. The Tutti Nung were bringing in 10 kilos a day, worth 100,000 pounds. They did this for 10 years. That's 365 million pounds. Docks and airports. They open up all sorts of possibilities for gangs. They did for the Liverpool Mafia and for one gangster called Curtis Warren. A leading figure in an international drug smuggling ring who controlled much of Britain's cocaine business. In 1991, Warren flew to Venezuela to set up a big cocaine shipment from the Cali cartel. Just to give you an idea of the planning, the cocaine was shipped inside 32 lead ingots, this big. It meant that they couldn't be x-rayed, and to cut them open would take hours. It's also said that Warren knew the length of the drill bits that the customs used, 25 centimetres long. Now just take a look at this. 25 centimetres means you can't get anywhere near the centre. It was with such ingenuity, he made the Liverpool Mafia Britain's first and most successful drug cartel. When the ingots arrived in England, customs cut one open, but found nothing and let the shipment through. Only then were they tipped off that they contained cocaine. But it was too late. The ingots were already on their way to Liverpool. Inside was a cocaine. Warren's cup was an estimated 87 million pound. Once a gang has cornered a market, it has to control it. It can't afford to let another gang push it off its turf. Gangs have always controlled their members and territory with threats and with violence. Any breach of loyalty could be dealt with in the most brutal way, even by death. The worst conflicts have taken place when a gang has split into two groups. This divides not only the gang members, but the territory as well, putting both under intense scrutiny, each side watching for an opportunity to provoke or attack the other. Gang feuds can last for decades. The tit-for-tat violence that ensues often spills out, endangering the lives of innocent people. This is what happened in Sheffield in the 1920s. A gangster called George Mooney had run a highly lucrative and illegal pitch-and-toss betting ring at Sky Edge above Sheffield. But when he slimmed down his operation by laying off some of his henchmen, they formed a rival gang called the Park Brigade. They were led by a man called Sam Garvin. Garvin was a bookmaker, gambler and promoter of bare knuckle boxing matches. He had amassed a string of convictions and prison sentences for assault, illegal gaming, con tricks and larceny. Garvin was a professional criminal, first conviction in 1904, very well connected with local politicians. When the first very decent council houses were built in Sheffield, he got one and there weren't many of them. In the depths of the depression, when everybody's living in poverty, he drove, an, he drove a three litre Bentley saloon. Now Garvin's gang, the Park Brigade, would begin a vicious feud with the Mooney gang and push gang warfare in Sheffield to a new level of violence, earning the city the name of Little Chicago. They attacked one of the Park Brigade in his bed, a man called Bill Furness, one Saturday night in April 1923. They attacked him with hammers, severely injured him, never reported to the police, but there were reprisals. A few days later, one of the Park Brigade was coming away from here, away from the tossing ring, and was slashed with razors over a hundred times. Wouldn't speak to the police, wouldn't say who'd done it. All he'd say was, I reckon they've spoiled me suit. <laughs> I reckon they had spoiled his suit. They had spoiled his suit. <laughs> but the vendetta between the two gangs would culminate in the most violent attack Sheffield had ever seen. It would be an innocent man, a non-gang member called William Plummer, who was going to experience just how ruthless Sam Garvin's Park Brigade could be. Princess Street, scene of the murder of William Plummer. So tell me about William Plummer. Who, who was he? What did he do? William Plummer was a 34-year-old Scotsman. He'd come to Sheffield after the First World War. 
to work in the steelworks. Father of three children, he had no connection whatsoever with gangs. But one evening, Plummer witnessed a violent fight. One of Mooney's men had been badly beaten, and Plummer had helped him to his feet. Unbeknown to him, the rival gang led by Sam Garvin now saw this as a reason to make him a target. Around 20 of Garvin's men hit Plummer with pokers, coshes, a piece of lead on a string, and this vicious weapon, ironically called a life preserver, a chair leg with nails in it. Although being badly beaten, Plummer managed to crawl back to the house, but as he struggled towards the door, he was then pounded repeatedly with a child scooter. Plummer had severe head injuries and two great wounds resembling bayonet thrust through his stomach and side. He was taken to the Royal Infirmary, where he died within minutes. There'd been slashings, there'd been shootings, there'd been bludgeonings, but he was the first man to be killed. It was the first murder of the Sheffield Gang Wars. It doesn't always have to be a split within a gang to create the violence. Rival gangs come up against the same brutality. In the 1950s, the Crays were a new breed of criminal, bringing with them a new type of violence, extreme and unpredictable. They were so terrifying, they made some gangs, like the Watney Streeters, simply run away. This is where Reggie, Ronnie, uh, Billy Jones and Bobby Ramsey came looking for the Watney Streeters who had done up Ramsey. What happened was the street has got wind that the craze mob was on its way. Uh, in the front was a, a, a fellow who got nothing to do with it, but was related to the street, a man called Terry Martin. Out the back go the Watley streeters whom the craze are really looking for. And uh, there is poor old Terry Martin in front, uh, left really more or less on his own. dragged out and given a stabbing with the bayonet. By who? By you know. Ronnie, uh, and possibly Bobby Ramsey. It's difficult to know who really does what, but they all give him a terrible hammer. So just here on this just pavement? Just here on this pavement, yeah. And where the Watney Streeters are... Uh, uh, have, have decamped, yes, very sensibly. More recent gangs who deal in drugs are just as violent. Drug dealing kickstarts a miserable cycle of addiction, crime and violence. For the gangs lower down in the supply chain, control of their drug turf is crucial. At street level, the violence they dish out is to be seen and feared. Sometimes it spills out, ruining the lives of innocent people. This is what happened in Manchester with the Gooch Gang. This was the Gooch Gang leader, Colin Joyce, known as the General. And this is Lee Amos, the other top man. They've been described by one senior copper as psychopaths who shoot for fun. These guys were at war with the Doddington gang and the Longsight crew. And in five years of shooting, 250 people were wounded and 27 were killed. These tit-for-tat killings culminated in two brutal shootings. They would shock not only Manchester, but the whole country, becoming a landmark in gang violence and ultimately bringing about the downfall of the Gooch Gang. Our story begins at 6.45, 15th of June 2007, right here on the corner of Anson Road, Longsight, South Manchester. A young man called Ukal Chin was gunned down in a roadside ambush. I want to find out how this happened, how an innocent man got caught up in a gangland shooting. So we're here on Anson Road. Uh, Ukal Chin got shot here, right? Yeah. He was, um, he'd been driving about with some friends that day. Colin Joyce, one of the senior members of uh, the Gooch Gang, was driving up and down looking for a alongside crew member or associate to go after. Somewhere along Anson Road, he spots Ucal Chin. The vehicle that he's in draws parallel to the Renault that Ucal is driving and opens fire and Ucal's killed. The likelihood is he was after UCAL. Why? Because he thought he was part of Longsight? UCAL came up in an area where gang membership simply defined by who your friends are. Mm. 
you might have friends who are more involved than you are, but you become associated with their gang because they're your friends. They might be the friends that you went to primary school with. They might be the friends that you've grown up playing football with, but that's enough to label you. And if you happen to be driving these lines about on a particular day and your face becomes associated with them, then it's a question of perception. That was enough to get you killed, unfortunately. Just as Manchester had the Gooch gang, Birmingham had the Johnson crew. Their callous displays of violence would shock the city. On the 2nd of January 2003, a revenge attack by a rival mob called the Burger Bar Boys would result in the murder of two innocent girls and shock the city and the nation. The incident was sparked when the Burger Bar Boys spotted their rivals, the Johnson crew, as a party held at a hair salon. They decided to attack them in a drive-by shooting. The woman who ran the hair salon had had this New Year's Day party for the last few years. It was well known, so they tagged along. You know, and the party, by all accounts, was uh, you know a normal affair. There was nothing unusual about it until the early hours of the morning, when people reported that the atmosphere started getting very dark. There was rumours around that there's going to be trouble. Something's going to happen. The car pulled into position, not far from the party. Inside, three members of the Burger Bar boys were armed, one of them with a Mac-10 machine gun. About four o'clock in the morning, yeah. the place was winding up. Uh, people were piling out the back and uh, basically just getting some fresh air. So the party spills out onto the street. Within a split second, 23 empty cartridges are spewed out from the machine gun. Charlene Ellis was the first to die, hit three times. Letitia Shakespeare was also killed, hit four times. I went to see Letitia's mother, Marcia, who had to go and identify her daughter only hours after the shooting. As soon as I went into the room, I could see um, Letitia, she had a hairpiece on that day. Mm. And I could see that was like slinched to one side. I thought, well, this is Letitia. So I came round um, to have a look and she was there on the bed, but her eyes were wide open. Really? I've never seen her eyes that wide open. Yeah. Um, and I still couldn't absorb that she was dead. I still thought she was alive. I said, yeah. no, she's alive. Her eyes are open. She's got to be alive. And when I was walking around and looking, and when I looked, because her eyes were so open, you could see like where like the blood shot, like yeah. the shock yeah, yeah. initially yeah. just, just yeah. killed her. She didn't have time to even close her eyes. Um, that aura stopped with me for about four weeks. I kept having nightmares, um, panic attacks. Um, just couldn't, I thought, nah, that hasn't happened. I yeah. didn't really think it happened. You can't believe it. You just can't take it in when no. something like that happens, can you? No, I yeah. couldn't. To the gangs, violence is just a way of life. Most of us remain unaware of it. But when it flares up and takes an innocent life, we are barely able to comprehend how this can be happening on our streets. How do you eliminate gangs? Well, one way is to remove their source of income. Look what happened to the prohibition of alcohol in America. When liquor was legalized again, the gangsters were forced to move off into other business. Another method was to target the gangsters themselves. This was the strategy used in the 1920s to eliminate the gangs of Sheffield. The local authorities were under pressure. They'd be, been ignoring the issues for a couple of years. It became apparent that they were going to have to do something. The police formed a special duties squad, colloquially known as the Flying Squad. They appointed a new chief constable. He would become Britain's first gangbuster. His name was Percy Silito. Age 38, Silito was an unorthodox choice. He'd left England to become a trooper in the African police, working in a tough and brutal regime which kept control over native tribes. Now, back in England, Silito would apply the same methods. 
He knew the name of every police officer in the force. They knew that they could go out and take war to the gangs and that the chief constable would be right behind them. So why was this any different to the police force before? They were bigger guys. They were bigger guys and they went out, they went to publicans and they told them don't serve gang members. If you serve gang members, we'll oppose your license. If they saw gang members in the pubs, they hauled them out and battered them. Really? There were no, there, yes, there, were, there, were, there was no human rights. So this was just there. another gang, really? Effectively, they'd be fire with fire, steel with steel. Silito brought in men like PC Pat Geraghty, who stood six foot five and could hold seven tennis balls in one hand. Silito also introduced the European Jiu Jitsu champion, Harry Hunter, to train the force in self defense. After seven weeks, each man could deal with 60 methods of attack. They fly in squads, <laughs> threw people through windows, they threw them through doors without opening them first. They battered people in public view. They, didn't, they took them around the back occasionally, but they, they didn't take any prisoners if they, need, if they didn't need to. Silito was seen at the time as a great success. He became Britain's first gangbuster and was also sent up to Glasgow. During the 1930s, the Billy Boys remained the most powerful gang in Glasgow. Marching behind their leader, Billy Fullerton, they set out to taunt the Catholic neighborhoods. The Billy Boys came marching down this street, Norman Street, inflaming the Catholic locals with their music. A large Catholic razor gang known as the Norman Conks, who lived in this street, often prepared to retaliate when they heard the Billy Boys approaching. The Norman Conks knew they were coming, heard they were coming because they weren't creeping up on them, and would ambush them. So from the windows, from roofs, if they could get onto them, they would attack them, throw missiles, throw bottles, throw dirt, anything at all, human waste. Uh, and then down in the street, there would be a battle royal going on. But by 1935, the Glasgow police now under the command of gangbuster Percy Silito, set out to ambush the gangs. Police mounted a charge led by Silito's Cossacks, as his force were known. It was the beginning of the end for the Billy Boys. Silito ordered the mounted police to Celtic Park, together with two large covered vans filled with policemen. They hid down a side street. There they waited. But they were clever with it. They didn't wade in at the height of battle. They waited until both sides uh, had more or less uh, worn each other out, and then the police would come in and mop it up in a far more ferocious way on occasion. This road here became littered with casualties. The police had broken up the parade, scoring an historic victory. According to Silito, only one of the Billy Boys escaped without injury. It was Elijah Cooper, the big drum player, who hid in his drum until he could surrender peacefully. Today, gang-related crimes can be the most complicated to solve. Often it's hard to work out just who's innocent and who's guilty, who's in one faction and who's in another. In Birmingham, police officers collected 1,300 statements, recovered 40 vehicles, and put tens of thousands of man-hours into bringing down the murderers of Charlene Ellis and Letitia Shakespeare to put away the Gooch gang in Manchester. Prosecution lawyers scrutinized 50,000 pages of evidence, 80,000 mobile phone calls, and offered unprecedented protection to witnesses in order for them to talk. It paid off. The Gooch gang were put away for a very long time. Only with this level of investigation can gangs be brought to justice. Even Curtis Warren, who often appeared to be one step ahead with his drug trafficking empire, was eventually cornered. On October the 24th, 1996, Dutch SWAT units raided a warehouse in Holland and Warren's home. And through a complex kind of undercover uh, surveillance operation involving wiretaps, they managed to catch him red-handed, bringing in uh, another superload of cocaine. The top five men in Warren's drug ring were among the 10 men dragged from their beds and arrested. The police confiscated 400 kilograms of cocaine, 60 kilos of heroin, 1,500 kilos of cannabis, and 50 kilos of ecstasy. Their street value, 125 million pounds. Simultaneously, British police searched premises across Northwest England, 
to arrest the gang's other cohorts. He goes to trial, it stacks up, and he goes to jail for, for a long time. During this series, I've been walking around some of the estates. I saw the same problems that existed 100 years ago. I see kids with nothing to do, locked into cul-de-sacs that they just can't escape from. It's almost impossible for them to go anywhere unnoticed. Many are from traditional immigrant families, desperate to find their own identity out on the street, where it's all about respect, and sometimes, violence. So where do we go from here? Where's the Percy Sillito of the 21st century? Well, let me tell you, it's right here. Strathclyde's Violence Reduction Unit. I'm about to meet Karen McCluskey. She's a director of this unit, which she set up in 2008. She's responsible for bringing about a radical new approach in tackling gangs. She did what no one had ever dared do before. She hauled in all the gangs and laid down the law to them. We wanted to try and make a big change because you can't just take 10 people. Mm. It has to be about hundreds to achieve a, a real big shift in gangs. So how did you do that? We had to get the parents, we had to get the schools, we had to convince them to come in. So you, you were putting rival gangs in the same way? Oh, they, all of them, all of them. I mean, this was about, you know, this was... It's a really risky strategy. And the chief stood up and, he, and we flashed their pictures around the room. Mm. And we said, we know who you are, we know where you live. And, and he said, I'm so powerful, I can have them all outside your front door if I so wish, my, my corpse. You know, I can make your life really difficult. It's not hard, you know, but we want you to stop. We want you to stop this because I don't want to go and see your parents and tell them that you're dead or they're coming to arrest you for a murder. And then we get a surgeon to stand up and he says, you boys might not know what you're doing, but let me, let me tell you what I get in my, my surgery. And he shows them the pictures. And some of them are really graphic, but, but that's what he says, you know, when we have some of the worst cases of facial injury anywhere in the world here, they cannot look at it. And we have a few fainters. Um, and then I suppose the, the, be the best and the worst part is we get a mum to stand up. And it is just, unless you'd seen it, mm. it's very difficult to, to explain. I can but imagine. she stands up yeah. and she says, you boys might not care about yourself, but here's what happened to my son when I cradled him when he died. And I go into his room every single day and I will never get over it. It's destroyed my husband, it's destroyed my family, and I cared about my son. And you, know, and you, you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. I know, exactly and where you can hear them. From. You can yeah. hear them sobbing in the mm. back. Because regardless of how beleaguered some of these families are, they love their mothers. Yeah. And it's the most powerful thing ever. And we, we then say, make a choice. You can make a choice here. And the really interesting thing is, for lots of the people that we deal with, they've got no choice about where they're born, what parents are born to, what school they go to, even what gang they go into. This sometimes is the first time in their life that they've had a choice. And it is amazing how many of them stand up in the court and say, I want out. I tell you, I can't... I'm shocked at what I've just seen in there. Karen off camera showed us some CCTV footage of uh, some gang violence, but real gang violence. It kind of hit home what this show's all about. It was just sickening to see kids acting like that. And uh, it's places like this that are working towards kind of fixing the problem. I'm still not convinced that it's a problem that can be fixed. I think it goes a lot deeper down than uh, just the one gang, you know, trying to take knives away. Or I think it's ingrained the problem. Listen, we can only hope. A hundred years ago, lads on the street in a poor area had few prospects and no real voice or rights. Joining a gang gave them a sense of belonging. The authorities pinpointed poor housing lack of family control and boredom as key causes. This still holds true today. But the big difference now is that many gangs deal in drugs, and the drugs they sell contaminate their neighbourhood, blighting the futures of those who touch them. Gangs will only stop selling drugs when the demand is removed. And only education 
or a change in the law can alter that. Many of the cities we've looked at in the course of this series have seen major gangs put away for a very long time. And with targeted policing, education and social initiatives, there's been a fall in violent gang crime. Let's hope it stays that way.